Okay. Um, what I plan to say today is dependent somewhat on what you'd like to hear. Uh, how many of you are very familiar with my work, have been looking at it for a, you know, a long time and, and understand it pretty well? And how many are not? It's kind of new to you. All right, well, the newbies have it by about three to one. Okay. When I gave my talks in Australia and New Zealand, I focused on culture, the cultural connection, and how we relate to our culture, how culture affects us, and I tied that into how if we can kind of cross-pollinate cultures, if we can connect across all of our cultures, how we humanity have a really unique first-time opportunity in the near future, near being a decade or two, to take a real big step forward in our spiritual quality, our scientific quality, both. But that talk depended that a lot of you knew my basic work, so I'm not sure whether I should do that or start anew with most of you not really being too aware of what I'm about. So maybe I'll start with a little introduction of who I am and kind of what I do and what my philosophy is. I'll do that first. And, then we'll work into the cultural connection, if we will. And I'd li also like to leave a lot of time for questions. Because my speaking to you, I don't think is important as you asking your question. Because your question will personalize what it is you need to know, where you're stuck, what you don't understand, where what I'm telling you doesn't make sense, you'll be able to, to break past those barriers of understanding if you ask questions rather than if you just listen to me talk. So I'd like to, to uh, leave lots of room for questions at the end. Okay, a short introduction. <coughs> Hopefully I won't go <coughs> too often, but the, the smog here and the, all of the exhaust fumes have my throat just a little raw since I've been here. In any case, I'm a physicist. I came into this world with a mission. I came into this world with a, with a plan of what it was I was supposed to be doing here. And I came in very right-brained. That means very intuitive. I saw big pictures. I connected with things without having to know about them. And that was the way I started. But I knew that I had to become left-brained. I had to develop that other side of me. And it was just something I knew. So when I first went to school, I found that math was difficult. Science was difficult. But I worked at it, and I worked at it. I worked very hard at it. And eventually, by the time I was halfway through my graduate degrees in physics, it got easy. And then it got easier and easier. So I did finally get that left brain up to where it would work for me. And I would describe myself as a very extreme left brain person and a very extreme right brain person all at the same time. And I think that's, that's good, at least it was good for me. That way we balance the way we view the world. If you're dominantly left or dominantly right, you see the world from a skewed perspective. You really need to balance both those hemispheres. And one of the things I bring to this, this knowledge, this information, this model, is a, an on-ramp. I call it an on-ramp, an approach that the left brain people in our world can use. You see, left brainers, when they when they look at most spiritual teachings, they just can't go there. They take a step and maybe the next step and then they say, nah, nonsense, prove it. They can't go any further. 
They're stuck at that point. And there's thousands of books for people who are right brain. There's lots of poetry. There's lots of metaphors for people who can process data at the metaphoric level. But there isn't really any path for the left brainers among us to go step by step, logical fact by logical fact, and end up in spirituality. So that was part of my mission here, is to try to develop that left brain on-ramp to spirituality. So that's why I had to become a physicist. That's why I had to learn how to do math and think in a logical process and make that a very key part of myself. Well, anyway, in around 1972, when I was working on my, I'd already collected a master's degree, I was working on my PhD at the university, uh, I learned to meditate, transcendental meditation. It was all the rage sweeping through the U.S. college campuses, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, and uh, transcendental meditation. So I signed up because at that point, I was unbalanced to the left brain side. I was in graduate school. And my idea of reality was that if you can measure it, it's real. If you can't measure it, it either isn't real or it doesn't matter. That's called, a, no, that's called materialism. That's a materialist viewpoint of reality. If it's not measurable, it's not interesting. Well, when I learned to meditate, and I took to it very naturally, very quickly, it didn't take me long uh, to get there, I found out that I could debug my computer code in my mind. I could bring up you know, thousands of lines of code and scan them by, just like I was looking at a printout, and all the ones that had errors in them would be colored red and the rest were just black on white, like regular print. And that was amazing. I thought, well, is this true? Are these actually going to be the lines that are wrong? And it turned out they were. So suddenly I could debug coder, uh, computer code very, very efficiently. I could find those errors. And in those days, debugging computer code isn't like it is today. In those days, you spent weeks, months just debugging computer code. There were no tools to help you do that. And your code was, <coughs> was written in thousands of punch cards. So the error may not have been your error at all. It may have been a punch error, where the puncher was just a tenth of a millimeter out of line. Couldn't tell by looking at it, but the computer would throw it out as nonsense. So it was very difficult in those days to debug code. So that was my first introduction to the larger consciousness system. And <coughs> at that point, I knew I had to revise my idea of what reality was all about. Because I couldn't measure what was going on, but it was real. And it interacted with this reality in a real way, but the process was completely not measurable. So suddenly my reality grew to something bigger. I got out of the university, went to work, and <coughs> within, uh, I don't know, six months or so, my first professional job as a physicist, uh, I met Bob Monroe. Bob Monroe is a, an American who wrote three books. First was Journeys Out of the Body. The second was Far Journeys and then Ultimate Journey. Bob Monroe had these experiences of lying down lifting out of his body. He could look back and see the body lying there and then go off on an adventure in some other reality frame other than this one. Scared him half to death. He thought he was going insane. It was something he wanted to stop doing. He couldn't stop doing it. It just happened. So eventually, after a couple of psychiatrists told him that he wasn't going insane, he decided to play with it see what he could do with it, where could he go, what happened, and he convinced himself after a few months that it was real. He could go, like we, what we now call remote view, see things, and go back and check, and sure enough, that's what was there. 
That's what was going on at that place at that time. Uh, so he found that he could interact with this reality and do evidential things. So he knew it was real, but nobody else did, because if it's not your experience, it's not your truth. So he was building a laboratory to study consciousness because he wanted to not just be the weird guy who had funny experiences, he wanted this to be science. And he had just had this lab built when I ran into him, and here I am, a young scientist, and I had a friend who <coughs> worked where I do, and uh, he was a, a, a double E, electrical engineer. So we made a deal with Bob. We said, Bob, you teach us what you know about going out of body, because if it's not our experience, it's not our truth either. You know, we won't understand it if we don't do it. And we'll set up your lab for you and do protocols and do experiments. So that was a deal right in around 72, 73. Started going out to Bob Monroe's, oh, 20 hours a week. It's like a half-time job, except it was evenings and weekends. So my career in physics and my career in conscious research both started in the same year, basically. And that was, like I say, in the 70s. See, that's 40 years ago. Been doing it ever since. I just stopped the physics end of it uh, four or five years ago, retired, but I'm still doing the consciousness part of it. So that's why, or that's how, a physicist like me ends up talking about consciousness and spirituality. It's because I've been doing both for a very long, long time. And when I was at Bob Monroe's, my idea there was to find out, is this real? I mean, is this really happening? What's going on here? And I thought, and if it's not real, if it turns out just to be nonsense, then, you know, I can just leave. So it's no harm done in trying to see what happens. And my friend, Dennis Menrick, the engineer, he had the same attitude. We're going to hang around and work with this as long as it turns out to be something worth working with, and as soon as it doesn't, we're gone. So we were not only open-minded, but we were kind of prejudiced. We thought that it's a good chance this was going to turn out to be nonsense, but we were open-minded enough to give it a try. So the first year or two, all we did was evidential things, remote viewing, healing, um, traveling places and, and meeting people, you know, interacting with the non-physical, because Bob did teach us pretty quickly how to just go to body. So we could do that whenever we wanted to. And I started, um, I guess about a, a mo about a year into the process, I started seeing auras. One day I'm walking down the street and suddenly there's this light coming out of everything. People, power lines, calculators, clocks, everything that had structure, everything that had process. And I thought, what is that all about? Is that real? You know, just close your eyes, rub your eyes, look again, it's still there. You know, so close your eyes, turn around, think of something else, look elsewhere, it's still there. So I played with it to see what it meant. I had no idea. I wasn't coming from a spiritual background, I was coming from a science background. And I just played with it. What did it mean? And over some months I found out, you know, basically what it meant. And I realized that you didn't have to actually look at anything to see the aura. All you had to do is think of it. You didn't have to look at a person to see their aura. You could see it in a photograph. And then I learned you didn't need the photograph. All you need to do is think of that person. That space and time were irrelevant. You can imagine what that does to a guy who's a physicist and very, uh, you know, very left brain. So my, my mission from then on was to understand consciousness. What's it about? How does it work? What are its limitations? Why is it the way it is? Where do they come from? You know, all the questions that anybody, particularly a scientist, would want to ask about consciousness. And over the next 35 years, up until 2003, I was working on that problem. And the way I worked on it was to do research in the larger consciousness system. Out of body was easy at that point. And I would go into the larger consciousness system and do something that was maybe evidential, remote view, heal, 
whatever, I'd work on that. And I got to where I knew what to do and to make it work. And it was, I was probably at the 85, 95, maybe even more than that, 98% chance as far as getting the right answers, having effective healing, getting the right remote viewing. So I kind of knew when it, when it was working. I change a variable. I do it a little differently in a different way. And then I do it 20 times. And then I put that variable back, do it 20 times. And then I change something else, do it 20 times. And I change a different variable. So I kept doing that. That's science. That's what scientists do. You know, they change variables and then they repeat experiments and they see what the difference is. And then that difference is logically connected to that, to that variable. So 35 years later, I thought I had it figured out. And I wrote the books, the My Big Toe books. The reason I named them that is, of course, toe in physics speak is theory of everything. Something that Einstein worked on for the last 20, 25 years of his life and was unsuccessful. Could not find that toe. Now, he was just looking for a little toe, not a big toe. His little toe was just to bridge relativity and quantum mechanics. That was a little toe. And he knew that there must be some bigger understanding that would derive both quantum physics and relativity because relativity had in it an assumption that was flatly denied by quantum mechanics and quantum mechanics had in it an assumption that was flatly denied by relativity. So the two of them were philosophically and logically incompatible. Therefore, there was something bigger on top of that from which you could drive both and each one of these just worked in a subset, but wasn't general. It wasn't general across you know, all reality. It just worked where it worked, and it didn't work other places. So he was looking for this superset that explained the two subsets. And that was going to be a theory of everything, because quantum mechanics and relativity pretty much described everything else in the physical world at that time. So he didn't succeed. He didn't succeed because the concepts where the answer lies to understand what this larger thing is from which both those sciences derive wasn't a concept that he, could, that he had. It wasn't in the culture, it wasn't anywhere. And that is the concept of reality as information, which brings us to virtual reality. <coughs> Excuse me, virtual reality. A virtual reality just means an, an information-based reality, a computed reality. Okay. These are all synonyms for the same thing, a virtual reality, computed reality, a simulation, or an information-based reality. Those weren't concepts. They did have very crude computers in those days, but the idea of actually using a computer to create a virtual reality was just nowhere in sight. That was, you know, 30 years, 40 years later, maybe more, even to the beginning of it, more like 50 years, 70 years later to the actuality. So the, the concept just wasn't there for that. That wouldn't make any sense to Einstein or any of the other great physicists of the time, that our reality was information. So that's why they couldn't get it. Now it's easier for us to understand this, particularly if you play virtual reality games particularly some of the newer games where they work pretty much the way this virtual reality works. I'm thinking of a <coughs> computer game called No Man's Sky, which was only, I think, uh, became available about a year ago. In any case, uh, I did find out about how it worked and I wrote the books the toe is the theory of everything. The fact that it's big is that it's not just a little toe about physics. It's a toe about everything. Not only the objective world that science studies, but the subjective world of intent and feeling, intuition. It is about what's normal and what's paranormal. It turns out paranormal is just normal. There's nothing really para about it, which means kind of beyond, on top of. 
it's just normal once you understand how reality works. Uh, there's it's nothing uh, too surprising about most of what's called paranormal. It's expected. It's necessary. Um, it's about metaphysics, and it's about physics. And I found out that the that consciousness, what I was studying, is the key fundamental thing behind all of reality. All reality is based on consciousness. Consciousness is fundamental. Everything else is virtual. Now, you may have other words that you would use. Instead of consciousness, you may talk about the spirit, the non-physical, um, soul, you know, there's lots of different words you might use to describe what I call the larger consciousness system. But being this left brain scientist that I, that I am, then I, I put it into metaphors that are appropriate for logical process because that's the pathway I was trying to build. As it turns out, the left brainers are the movers and shakers of the world. They tend to be the doctors, the lawyers, and the Indian chiefs. They tend to be, you know, the people who make the laws and enforce the laws. The left brainers are our politicians. They're the ones that make the rules, enforce the rules, and all the rest of us end up having to obey the rules. So giving these folks a pathway forward is important. Also, the scientists today are what I call the high priests of our culture. It's the high priests are the people that tell us what to believe. It's always been the job of the culture's high priest to tell the people what's, what's true and what's not. And the scientists, mostly the physicists these days, have inherited that role. If the physicists all say, well, this is nonsense, it doesn't work that way, then everybody agrees yeah, that's nonsense. Or if they say this is true, everybody agrees that that's true. That's the role of the high priest. And the religion they preach is called materialism. So it's important to get an on-ramp for these people because they tend to dominate our culture. And the, what we'd like to do is to not only give them an on-ramp, but to encourage them to take that on-ramp and expand their understanding of reality in a way that in a decade or two, we have a totally different world here to live in. And later I'll get to how that might actually happen. That's not so far-fetched as it sounds. It's not so far away as it would seem. Just looking at the way it looks now, you'd say, eh, not in a century. But it could go a lot quicker than that. Okay, so that's maybe a, a quick introduction to me. Um, my, my metaphors, my symbols, my poetry, I guess, I try to keep it logical. But my metaphors are in terms of information, virtual reality. What I discovered was I read these books about consciousness, and then I discovered that if you understood consciousness, you could also understand physics. I should have gotten that earlier, but they had been published for two years before it finally went off that, oh, you can take the exact same principles that explain consciousness and explain the double slit experiment, explain quantum mechanics, make quantum mechanics change from a weird science that nobody understands to a perfectly logical science that you can get the answer to the, to the quantum mechanics problem just by following the logic of the problem, not by doing the math. Right now, of course, the famous quote is, shut up and calculate, right? That's the famous quote. Dr. Richard Feynman said that to his students. He said, Dr. Feynman, what's going on here? How does this work? And Dr. Feynman knew that there was no answer to that because they had no idea how it worked. They just knew if they did the math, they could get the right answer because quantum mechanics was just weird science. So he told his student, just shut up and calculate. That's what quantum mechanics is about. Well, once you understand consciousness and virtual reality, you don't have to calculate. You can just look at the problem and 
let's say what the answer is. It all follows a nice logical flow. So it's better physics. And uh, shame on me for not seeing that much earlier, but at least I did see it. <coughs> and then I found out that not only did understanding consciousness answer the mysteries of quantum mechanics, but they also answered the mystery of relativity. Ah, so there it was, the little tau, right? Something from which both of those could be derived. When you have a virtual reality, a computed reality, you can think of it like a, a virtual reality game. And you get that game on a monitor. A monitor is just made up of a lot of little pixels, little dots of light. There's only a couple of bits of information there. Color, intensity, and location. That's it. So you get a million little dots of light and you look at it and you say, oh, that's my elf. He's running through the woods and there's a stream and you know, there's a monster and he's holding a sword. And you get all of that out of looking at a million little dots of light. Okay, you interpret the data to be that reality. That's the way our reality works. You interpret the data to be this reality. Okay, so let's take this metaphor a little further. There's some basic principles about virtual reality that are true for all virtual realities, whether it's a computer game or whether it's this reality that we live in. Okay, they're true, just the same. One of those is, is that the computer that's computing the virtual reality cannot be in the virtual reality. In other words, the elf running around in World of Warcraft virtual reality will never open a door and find the computer that's computing his reality inside his reality. See, that, that's nonsense, right? It doesn't make any sense. The reality can't compute itself. So the computer that computes the reality has to be in some other reality, not the one the elf's in, not in the virtual reality that is created. And that some other reality will seem to be non-physical to the elf. <coughs> so from the elf's point of view, the computer has to be in some other reality, not his. It has to be non-physical to him. What the elf doesn't know is that his elfness, if you will, is just a bunch of ones and zeros on a computer drive someplace that he really is his consciousness. The consciousness of the elf is the player. That's the person sitting at the computer, looking at that monitor with all those little dots on it, making decisions for the elf. That's the player. Without that player making decisions, what to do, making choices for the elf, the elf just stands there. Maybe wobbles a little, but he just stands there. He doesn't do anything. The player says run, the player says fight, the player says jump or dance, or whatever. Stand up, sit down. The elf does all those things. Look right, look left. The elf will do those things. Without, without those choices from the player, nothing happens. Well, the elf also won't find the player in his reality. The player is also non-physical. <coughs> the player is the elf's consciousness. You see, the consciousness is what makes your choices. Now the, the computer and the player have to communicate, right? The player types on a keyboard, moves the mouse, which is his way of inputting directions to the elf. That goes to the computer. The computer then changes the ones and zeros and the little pixels change to make the elf stand up. Okay? So the, the consciousness, the player, and the computer just have this dialogue going on. So then the computer computes that elf standing up, shows the player that picture, and computes all the consequences of that standing up. Oh, he stood up, now his enemies can see him, or whatever. There's consequences to all those actions. So the computer and the, pl and the player are in a dialogue with each other, passing data back and forth. The computer sends data to the player who looks at his screen and interprets it. Okay. And if the player isn't good at interpreting it, the player may not understand what's going on or why it's happening or what it means. The player just gets an interpretation. All right, now what does that mean to us? 
let's then make us the elf. This physical world is a virtual reality. Yeah. Your, your, uh, your background in, in uh, uh, Buddhism and Hinduism both will tell you great sages said that this world is maya. It's, you know, they didn't say a virtual reality, but they said it was illusion. Same thing. You see, I'm not really bringing anything new here. I'm putting it into a context of modern terminology and metaphors and seeing it as a logical process. That's what's different. <clears throat> Most of the conclusions are the same. Same conclusions that have been around for two and a half millennia. Okay, so now here we are. We are, we are consciousness. We're not this body. This body and this room and this whole physical universe are ones and zeros on a computer drive someplace. We're consciousness. We're getting a data stream from the computer. We interpret that data to be this reality. Just like if we're playing a game. See, that's the nature of virtual realities. So that's another, see, that's a, a new set of metaphors now, if you will, but a modern computer-based set that the left brain people can say, ah, I get that. That makes sense. Okay. So that tells us what we are and what we are not. We are not these bodies. And when we talk about going out of body, you don't have to go out of body. You were never in your body in the first place. All you have to do is wake up and get into your consciousness because that's what you really are. You're not a body. See? <clears throat> then <clears throat> we'll have to digress to, well, why is this virtual reality here? You know, I mean, so, so why is it here? All right, I'm a consciousness. I'm playing this avatar in this virtual reality, but for what purpose? For what reason? Well, to understand that, you have to go <coughs> kind of back to the beginning of this consciousness system. This consciousness system is an information system, a digital information system. Digital just means discrete. <coughs> and, it f <coughs> excuse me. and at first, that doesn't tend to make sense. It's getting kind of crazy, right, when you think of this, I'm consciousness and it's a digital information system. But look at what is consciousness? You know, what are you conscious of? Oh, you can see that's a digital particle called a photon that is focused by your lens that hits the retina, which creates a lump of electrical charge, right? A electrical pulse that runs down the optic nerve, gets to the brain, which reconfigures neurons. These are all digital things. A lump of charge, neurons, these are all little bits of things that are being rearranged. It's just information. You're hearing. All your senses collect information. Okay, so the same, this idea that consciousness is information now doesn't sound quite as weird because that's it. Everything we're conscious of is nothing but information. Okay. So then here we are, in <coughs> we are individuated units of consciousness playing a virtual reality game for some purpose. I'm going to take a little pill here for my throat if you don't mind. Some fisherman's something or other, I don't know, English. Keith. Fisherman's Good. friend. Fisherman's friend, oh. yeah. Maybe that'll help a little. So, why? Why is this virtual reality here? What's the point of it? If, if that's what we're doing. Well, an information system ha can, can change, can evolve. It changes just like anything else. Information systems have to grow or die, you know, or get more complex or less, based on a term called entropy. Entropy is a measure of disorder. High entropy, lots of disorder. Your teenager's bedroom, high entropy. Okay. Lots of disorder. A uh, 
information <coughs> requires bits, which are the smallest unit of information. It's called a bit. <coughs> information requires these bits to be ordered. If all the bits are random in an information system, there is no information. Information requires order. Put these bits in a specific pattern and now give that pattern meaning. Make that pattern a symbol for something. Now you have information. So randomness is a lack of information. Order creates information. An information <coughs> system then evolves by lowering its entropy, decreasing its randomness, putting its bits together in some way that's meaningful to it. Okay. Now, if you're an information system and what you do is communicate, <coughs> well, I guess that would better back up to that. If you're going to communicate, if you're just one big information system, you can only communicate to yourself. You're everything. That is very limiting. The way you evolve is by decreasing your entropy. That means rearranging things in different interesting and meaningful ways. More choice. <coughs> more novelty. Well, you get more choice and more novelty with, st with structure, right? Constraints define a game. Constraints define choices. So if you're just this one big system talking to yourself, your evolution's limited. You can only go so far and talking to yourself <laughs> only gets you you know, so much order because it's all self-referential. So what you do <coughs> is you break pieces of it apart. Each one of these pieces now is just a chip off the old block, you know, came from the source. They all have free will. That's the nature of consciousness. There is no consciousness without free will. There is no free will without consciousness. Neither of those concepts mean anything without the other. Consciousness is a choice making. You have to have free will to make the choices, otherwise they're not choices. So it creates more individuated units of consciousness. They all have free will, they can interact. Now the novelty, the potential for new things coming is much greater because you have interaction, you have diversity, because each one of these chunks, even if they started the same, their experience is gonna be different. They're gonna become different things that are gonna interact in different ways. So you make lots of them. Lots and lots of these little individuated unit of consciousness. Isn't that what we are? You and I and all of us here are little individuated units of consciousness. Okay, so now you have this system. It wants to evolve by lowering its entropy, by creating order, creating information, creating value. And it has these individuated units of consciousness to make a richer soup of the choices. But all consciousness can do is trade information. It's an information system. All right, these two individual units, you know, they'll communicate, they'll send things back and forth, they'll interact. And that's a slow road to lowering entropy because there's no consequences. I shouldn't say no, but there's very few consequences in that. It's like a big chat room. It's like if you were in a chat room with, you know, a million chatters. No rules, just chat. What would you learn? What could you be sure of? You know, what are your consequences? Well, there's really no traction for that, for growth. So how do you get traction? With constraints. How do you get uh, 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 consequences? With constraints. Think of, a, think of a game. If we all said, okay, let's play a game. Okay, we're gonna take the next five minutes and play a game. Go ahead, start. Nobody would know what to do. Everybody just sit there, right? Why? Because there's no rules. What are rules? Rules are constraints. Here's what you can do. Here's what you can't do. Ah, once you have constraints, you have strategy. Uh, here's the, what you can do. Here's what you can't do. There's the goal. Now I've got a game, you see. So constraints is what provides choice. Now you have choices you can make. You know what to do. 
Otherwise, it's just, let's play, go. You have no choices because there's no constraints. See, it's the constraint that makes that choice, gives it context, gives it meaning, gives it significance. So what we need here is some sort of set of constraints wherein these individuated units of consciousness can interact with each other, but in a way that helps them lower their entropy, which is what they're supposed to be doing, right? That's their goal. It's the whole reason they were created was to help this thing evolve. It evolves by lowering its entropy. Well, the system finally decided how to do that. It would create a set of constraints. Those constraints are what I call a rule set. They define the game. And they started a simulation, a virtual reality, with some initial conditions and a rule set. Well, how would they go about doing that? Well, you've all heard of this. The initial conditions are a very small little ball of high temperature, high pressure plasma, right? And then you push the run button and bang, big digital bang. That plasma expands according to the rule set. As it expands, it cools. Suns form, planets form. You end up with this physical universe as a simulation. Okay, now right away, the physical universe isn't very useful to consciousness because it's just a simulation. The outer loop of the simulation is a time loop because it's called a dynamic simulation, which means things change in time. So if you're a digital system, how do you create time? That's easy. You've got one of these little binary cells that goes one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. That's a metronome. It's a clock. So that creates time. And once you've created time, see, time's a technology. It's a technology created by the larger conscious system to give it another whole dimension in which it could create order, structure, information. So now, instead of just patterns of things, you get sequences of things. Things can happen before and after each other, you see. So you have a before and after. Before that, you still had a before and after. There's a primordial time. Otherwise, you couldn't have had the very first, you know, your consciousness wouldn't start. Consciousness evolves. Evolution requires time. Evolution logically needs a before and an after, right? What you were now and then you evolve to something else. That requires time. Okay. Change requires time. So there was always a primordial time, but the 1010 gave us regular time, constant time. And with that, we could run a simulation that was dynamic. So there's an outer time loop to this simulation. There's every little delta T, just like in any computer, everything gets recalculated, and what was like this is now like that, and then like that, and then like that, and that's how we get motion. It's all calculated, every delta T. These delta T's are very small, about 10 to the minus 44 seconds. Very, very small. <coughs> so it's a good simulation. We see the motion as being smooth because we can't look at times that are that short. That's often referred to as Planck time. Okay. And the, uh, the pixel, like on your screen, you've got those million little dots of light. Well, the pixel here is a little dot of volume, but you know, you take the cube, cube root of a volume and you get a distance. So the distance is what's called the Planck length, which is about 10 to the minus 36 meters. Well, if you take that distance, which is one pixel, right? So I'm saying going in the X direction, one pixel, I can do that in one delta T because every time I recycle through the next delta T, I get to compute how everything changed and things can't jump from this pixel to some other pixel because that would be teleporting and it makes your reality kind of squirrely and undependable. So you never know where things are gonna be. That's not a good virtual reality. It kind of makes the rules too loose. So if you can only move one pixel in one delta T, that's your speed limit. You can't go any faster than that. Every delta T, you get to move a pixel. The next delta T, you can move one more. Every virtual reality has a speed limit because that's the way simulations run. That's why relativity works. Relativity is based on the fact that 
C, the, sp the speed of light, is a constant. Nothing else, no, no other thing is like that. Only photons are like that. Everything else, velocities add. If I'm riding in a car at 10 kilometers an hour, I have a ball in my hand and I reach out the window and I throw that ball another 10 kilometers an hour in the forward direction of the car, the ball now is going at 20 kilometers an hour relative to the ground. 10 from the car, 10 from the throw, velocities add. If I have a flashlight and I'm going some speed and I turn my flashlight on, it doesn't matter. It always comes out C. No matter how fast you're going when you send out photons, it doesn't add. C is a constant. It's the upper speed limit. Not only that, relativity says some really strange things happen when you approach the speed of light. In the direction of your travel, dimensions get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So if you started out on the ground at being a, a meter long, the faster you get, you get shorter and shorter and shorter and until you get to the speed of light, you disappear altogether. That's a, an anomalous point, a singularity that just doesn't seem to exist, but it, you can only approach the speed of light, you can't ever get there. Not only does the thing, do things get smaller and smaller and smaller in the direction of the motion, they get heavier and heavier and heavier. The mass grows. So not only do you get smaller and smaller and smaller until you disappear, but you get heavier and heavier and heavier, more and more mass, until your mass goes to infinity at the speed of light. So you turn into nothing that is infinitely massy. See, strange, weird physics, right? Again, you can't actually do that because you never can actually get that fast. Massy things won't go that fast. But every virtual reality has a speed limit. Our speed limit is the speed of light. Photons are those things that move one pixel every delta t. Everything else takes a lot of delta t's to move a pixel. You see, we're a lot slower. <clears throat> so then that is why relativity works. Because once you have the speed of light being a constant, a little algebra will get you special relativity. Once you have special relativity, more than algebra, will take you to general relativity. That just adds gravity into the special relativity. So you can see relativity is based on that one idea. So now that's Einstein's little toe. We've got, we've got uh, relativity and quantum mechanics both derived from consciousness, just from understanding consciousness. So I'll talk a little bit about the relativity. I mean, the um, quantum mechanics. The first experiment that showed scientists that they were indeed living in a reality that was not materialistic was the double slit experiment. Very famous experiment. How many don't have any idea what the double slit experiment is? All right, I'll explain it. A double slit experiment was this. In the 17 and 1800s, we understood that if you shined a light from a long distance away, uh, you had to back a big piece of cardboard, say, a barrier, and you put two little slots in the barrier so that the light was a long way off. That gave it a, uh, that the light then was in phase. That's why we put it a long way off. Anyway, the light would go through one, some of it would go through one hole, some of it would go through the other hole. And these two sources of light then, on the other side of the barrier, it was like two sources of light. These two sources of light would interfere with each other. That's because light has a wavelength. Light's a wave. And what would happen is that if you have, well, I thought I might use this. What, what happens is, is that here's your, there's a, sl <coughs> there's a slit, there's another slit. Light's coming this way in these big, so we started a long way off to this real big, like spheres, if you like, a light coming out from the source. When they get here, now, a little, you'll have a little light will come through this hole, a little light will come through that hole, 
And let's say they go, here's a barrier now. I'll call this the screen. The light that comes through this one, and this will be perpendicular to that screen and goes here, and the light that comes here, both of these paths will be the same distance, won't they? Exact same length. So if this light is a wave, the waves up and down, you know, think a sine wave, they're up and down. Well, these have exactly the same path. So they started in phase here. They'll still be in phase when they get there. So you expect a little, blight, a little bright spot of light here. But now, let's move it to this spot. Now we have light going here and light going here, excuse me. These path lengths are different now. The one on the bottom is longer than the one on top, right? It's just the way it works. Well, if the difference in those two lengths is exactly half of a wavelength, now one of the light that does the longer path it will be one half wavelength ahead, I mean behind the light that does a shorter path. So now they get to that point and where one's bumping up, the other one's bumping down and they combine, they interfere with each other and the plus and the minus add to zero. You get no light at all. So you get a dark spot there, no light. But now let's go up another spot to here <coughs> and to here. Now this one's even shorter yet than that one. The bottom one's even more long compared to the top one. And now let's say that the difference between those two path lengths is exactly one wavelength. So if it's exactly one wavelength, then even though they're one wavelength behind, the humps come together, the dips come together, and you get another spot of light here. So you had a spot of light, darkness, spot of light, darkness, spot of light, and so on. What they found was that these slits would then create little stripes. If you look at it from another viewpoint, if this is the screen, rather than looking at the screen on edge, we look at it, fat, you'd find that right in the middle was this, the black now is gonna be light, right? And then over here, there'd be another one, and here, and here, and here, and here, and so on. That was the middle band right there. And each one of these, as you go out, you see, here's a light, here's a little strip of light because you got a little slit there. And here's a little strip of light and there and there and there with darkness in between them. Those are called interference fringes. Okay, the light interfered and produced these. And it's also called a diffraction pattern because the light is said to diffract. That's a $10 word for a 50 cent concept. It just means they interfere. The light interferes. So this is something that people knew in the 1800s. They had figured all this out. They knew light was a wave. They could bend it with prisms. They could sp spread the frequencies apart and get the rainbow from the white light. And optics was one of the first sciences that got started in the 17 and 1800s. Then comes Albert Einstein. And Albert Einstein did some work, which earned him a Nobel Prize, with um, photoelectric effect. Photoelectric effect basically has light hitting a special kind of surface, knocks an electron out of an atom, that electron then creates a current. So we have light producing electricity. And he was able to show that light always came in some integer number of quanta, okay? That there was a smallest light particle and then all the other physicists said, particle? Did you say particle? Light's not a particle. Light's a wave. See, they're different. A particle's a little chunk of matter that goes someplace, and a wave is just an energy. It's a, it's a flow of energy. It's a different things. So that created a big problem in physics because Einstein had solid evidence that light was a particle. It came in discrete chunks of momenta. And History, the science before him showed that light was a wave. So the clever scientist said, well, let's, let us decide which one it is. What is it? So here's our screen again. So they were able to 
produce this coherent light like this. And they found a way to compute that they could make this light dimmer and dimmer and dimmer to where the math said they would only have one photon every once in a while. Very hard experiment to do back in 1920. But they did this. They could get the light so dim that it only had one photon every once in a while. Was, at least that was their theory, the way they computed it. Well, what they expected was that they would find a big pile of photons here and a big pile of photons here and nothing else, right? Because you're shining light and it's a particle now. It's a chunk. It's not a wave. It's going to go through a hole. It's going to hit right behind the hole. That's what little chunks of mass do. Well, what they found when they threw, when they put particles in here is that it didn't do that. It didn't do that at all. When they put the particles through here, they found out that it gave them the diffraction pattern, just like it had before. The particles somehow <coughs> went through these two slits and then afterward distribu distributed themselves in this diffraction pattern. Well, that was very strange. Why would particles do that? Because Newton, a century or two earlier, had told us that particles will always travel in a straight line unless they're acted on by some outside force. So particles had to hit behind each slip, but they didn't. So they put a little detector here. Let's put a little detector here, we'll call it D, and we'll put a little detector here, D, that'll tell us whenever a particle goes through a slit, we'll know. And now we'll see, it'll go through that slit, we'll see what happens to it. Well, they put those detectors there, and when they did, they got, just as they had expected before, they got a pile of photons there and a pile of photons there. So every time they looked at where the particle went through the slit, which is now called which way data, which way did the particle go through top slit or bottom slit, they would get the electrons to pile up in piles. But if they didn't look and see which slit it went through, the electrons would distribute themselves in a diffraction pattern. Very big mystery. Then the mystery got worse. They left the detectors there. At first they thought the detectors had something to do with it. Somehow the act of detection was changing things. But they left the detectors detecting. Didn't change that. They just didn't take the data. So the detectors were sending off the detections, but nobody was collecting the data. Okay. And what happened? They got the diffraction pattern. And then they realized that whether they got a diffraction pattern or not was determined by whether they collected information or not. That reality was information-based. That photons were not particles in the classical sense. They were something else that acted like particles and sometimes they acted like waves. And that was called complementary principle, a duality between particles and waves. But then they found out it was even stranger than that because they did the same experiment with electrons. And the electrons worked the same way. Oh, so it wasn't magic of light or photons. Then they did the particle with hydrogen atoms. Then they did it with bigger and bigger chunks of particles. The, about 10 years ago or so, they did it with buckyballs, which is a carbon uh, molecule of 60 carbon atoms. Kind of looks like, if you see a picture of this molecule, it looks like a soccer ball. It's a bunch of, it's a bunch of, of uh, carbon atoms. They do the same thing. If you see which slit the buckyball goes through, it was named after Buckminster Fuller, that's why it was called buckyballs. If you look, they pile up behind the slits. If you don't look, they distribute themselves in a diffraction pattern, you see? And since then, just in the last several years, they've had things much bigger than buckyballs. The last one I heard of was something like 236 atoms or something in some big molecule that they did that and it works exactly the same. Theory is that anything would work that way. This is a, 
a, a, an aspect of, of nature. It's just the way things are. So if you send particles at these double slits, you know, you could think you could drive, you know, you could, you could throw a toaster at it or a cement truck and it would work the same way, but the experiment doesn't scale. It's, that's not practical. So that's outside of the, of the ability to do things like that. But as technology gets better, we keep sending bigger and bigger things through and we're up to now pretty big molecules for that. So that's called the double slit experiment. It's a very famous experiment. It was done in the early 1900s. It kind of got started, I guess, right early 1900s, but they just had kind of finished it up and got all of their data together about 1925 or so. It's where they kind of made their first report, which came out in a, in a document that was called the, the Copenhagen, okay, it was, it was, it was uh, a bunch of physicists got together in Copenhagen with Niels Bohr, he, he was the host of that, and uh, they all decided just what reality was, what was going on here. You see, these little chunks of matter aren't acting like chunks of matter. This is not a materialistic reality. This is a reality based on information. It matters what you know, what you observe. And it's not the detectors that make the difference. It's the observation that makes the difference. This has been done with detectors that don't ever touch the particle with energy. They've done very clever designs where... My question is, the detection is done through any external device and you say they don't touch. How yeah. Yeah. He is the detectors as you said, as you put the detectors, the detectors collect the information of the pattern through. The pattern changes. Mm-hmm. But as a human, a human consciousness, if it observes, just observes the particles, as you're saying the particles are getting there by time. Yeah, now you're in a gray area that mostly has never been researched. Just trying to find that area of well, if it was just one human, and what if that human didn't have any idea what was going on? You know, was it if it's, what if it's a chimpanzee that watches it? You know, what difference would that be? Or if the human was a physicist, would that make a difference because he knows what's going on and so on? You see, there's lots of variations there, but scientists have never gone there. They've never gone there because they really didn't like this, and they still don't like this. But that was... These are the facts, and they've had to live with it, and that's why they call it just weird science. Because it's easier to blame science being weird than it is to say, we just don't understand. And materialism just you know, won't answer this question. So it got even stranger than that. They did collect the data, ran the detectors, collected the data, but didn't look at the data, collected it. Okay, here it is. Here's my data, but I'm not going to look at it. Then I'm going to erase it. Without ever looking at it, they got a diffraction pattern. Ah, sounds like things are working backwards, like you're violating time, right? I mean, you don't look at the screen either. You don't look at the screen. You don't look at the results. You don't look at anything. But here you have all this data collected. But you've never actually seen the screen. You erase the data, you get a diffraction pattern you don't erase the data, then you get a, the two lumps. The thing is, that erasing the data could happen a year after you collected this data. You see, you could collect all the data, never look at it, have the data here, erase it a year later, and that'll be a diffraction pattern. So it makes it look like you're having an effect in the past, okay? You're not. It just looks that way if you are a materialist. If you're a materialist and you expect material causality, then it looks like something's happening in the past. That's called a delayed quantum eraser experiment. And they do these in such a way that the detectors never touch the particle. So it's not the detector interfering with it. Now, I've just described to you kind of the, the, the essence of it. You know, the experiments themselves are actually more complicated than my description, but you're getting kind of the basic of what's going on there. All right, so 
these delayed quantum er uh, erasures are doubly and triply confusing to scientists because it looks like you're changing things in the past. The key here is information. The key here is a computed reality that needs to be consistent. We knew that optics said that light was a wave, it acted like a wave. Light, we knew as a wave, if we show this light on it, instead of sending, you know, we did this light instead of having a little particle being shot here, we, we did the light, we know we get diffraction patterns, okay? And if we send lots of particles, not one at a time, but millions at a time, we get diffraction patterns. And then people said, well, what's going on? What makes those little particles interact with each other to give us diffraction patterns? You see, but then they send the one particle and they get a diffraction pattern. So they're just showing up here as diffraction patterns. Well, how does that work? The way it works is our reality is not material. Those are not material particles, whether they're buckyballs or big molecules or whatever they are. They are just probability. And this probability will change with space. There's some probability. It's called the wave function. The wave function in quantum mechanics is a probability function. And there's some probability of it being someplace. And that probability function comes out of the rule set so that there is a consistent boundary between wave behavior and these small particles. You see, if these particles one at a time didn't distribute themselves in a diffraction pattern, you'd have a clash. You'd have two facts in your world that were incompatible with each other. That's not a good virtual reality. That's a very poor virtual reality that has, you know, facts that are developed in it that each says the other is impossible. They clash. So the rule set was made so that the probability function looks just like these these things, you know, so here's our, here's our this and there's that one. I'm trying to make these a little more reasonable. You got a probability function that looks sort of like this. It's a big, there's a big peak here for probability and then it comes down here and then there's a peak like that, like that, like that and so on and it goes away. And up here it's the same sort of thing. So that's the probability function and that's exactly the same way they gather particles. I could also say that this probability function is the number of particles they get at each position. They get most of the particles here. This is a real dark line. If dark line is more particles, and then each, they get fewer here and here, but the same here and the same here, the same here and the same there, fewer and fewer and fewer, and out here you don't get much. That's exactly what happens in diffraction patterns. So the rule set sets this up so you don't have an inconsistency in the virtual reality. Now, these particles aren't particles, they're probability distributions. And the rule set determines how that probability works out. So it's just the larger consciousness system giving us a nice consistent reality in which to make choices so that things are con you know, continuous, consistent. So that's why it works that way, it's the rule set. And you can, the logic of this is that there are no particles. You know, all these things are virtual, right? It's a virtual particle, it's a virtual screen with virtual slits and a, all this stuff's virtual. The system controls it all. It's all computed in a virtual reality. Yeah, there's so much to get through and so little time to do it in. Uh, I'm going to finish up the physics, and uh, I've got just a few more points to make there, and then we're going to get more into applications. Okay. Once you understand basic concepts of theory, then let's talk about, okay, so what? You know, what does this mean to me? How can I use it? What's important here? Uh, <clears throat> well, I'll finish up on the physics first. What I just showed you with the double slit experiment um, has been known in physics for about 80 years as <coughs> the observer paradox. It's a paradox means that they can't explain it with a material explanation. The observer paradox is why is it when an observer, and by that they mean somebody taking data, 
the observer is often a, a, a you know an electronic tape or memory or something that's taking the data. So it's not necessarily an observer means a, a person. But <coughs> here's the here's the uh, connection to that. Remember we talked about the consciousness is the player in this game gets a data stream they interpret <coughs> that data to be this reality if the person if the consciousness doesn't get a data stream then there's no reality to interpret right so the consciousness getting the data that's the measurement getting the data is making the measurement Consciousness gets a data stream, then the consciousness has made some sort of measurement. They've used their senses. They've collected some data. They've opened a door to see what's inside. When they see what's inside, that's getting the data. Okay? <clears throat> if there's no data, there's no reality. When you look at World of Warcraft and your elf running around, if you unplug your computer and there's no data, there's no reality for you. Right? <clears throat> now, the way it works is that if anybody gets some data that defines something here, like, oh, you know, here's a chair. I got data. There's a chair. So now in my data stream, I get this room, I get this chair, I get all this stuff is in my data stream. I interpret it in terms of my senses because that's how I learned to do it as an infant. That's how you learn. Okay. Once I see it, once it's here, once somebody knows it's here, then it has to be here for everybody. It can't be, well, there's a chair in this room for me, and the room has blue on it and has you know, lights in the ceiling, and somebody else walks in, and the chairs are all red, you know, and the lights are all on poles. Once it comes into this reality, it stays into this reality. Okay. Now, they first explained the double slit experiment that way. The measurement, they say, collapsed the probability wave into a particle. Before that, the particle was just probability, didn't exist. It was a potential particle. It wasn't a real particle. There are no real particles. But then when you make the measurement, you say, oh, I want to look at the slit and see what's there. Now you caused something to be sent in the data stream to tell that person that a particle went through the slit. Once you do that, once it's here, it has to stay here. So after that, it acts like a particle and goes straight on through and hits the hits the screen in one spot right behind a slit, you see? So it's the observer <coughs> getting the data stream that creates something in that reality. So you're playing World of Warcraft and your elf chops down a tree, okay? Now if some other character comes in who's playing it and they look at the tree the elf chopped down, they'll see the tree chopped down. If your elf hadn't chopped down the tree, they would see the tree standing up. So once you do something, the data stream puts it in this reality, it stays in this reality. All right? So that's the way it works. So that's the way then these particles work. Once you take the measurement and say, oh, here it is, I see it. Now it's in the reality and now it acts like a particle. When you don't do that, no measurements made, no data is coming to a data stream, it's still just potential. And it distributes itself according to that, that uh, probability distribution I showed you. You see? <coughs> that's why you, you, uh, you know, that's why it works that way. So, that's what the person has to do with it. You know, why is the observer important? Why is there this, you know, ob observer paradox? It's because reality only exists in the mind of the consciousness. You see, this physical reality isn't really here. We're getting the data stream and this is how we interpret it. Just like that World of Warcraft reality really isn't there. That elf isn't really there. Neither are the rocks, the trees, the monsters, all the rest of that stuff isn't there. The mountains, it's not there. You just interpret that with the data. So now you're logged into this virtual reality, you're getting a data stream, and here's what you get. Here's how you interpret it. How did you learn to interpret data like that? It started when you were born, and you looked around and you saw things, and you figured out the difference between mother, your mother and an apple, or your dresser, or the beds you were sleeping in, or whatever, and you just learned and learned how to interpret data. 
and eventually you have a, a history, you have a background, you have a, a set of interpretations. It's the same way <clears throat> we, we look at the World of Warcraft map and we interpret all those lights as rivers and streams and elves because that's how we interpret those kinds of structures and images. It's our habit to do it that way. If there was somebody who had never seen a, uh, you know, a humanoid or an elf or, or a river or a tree, they wouldn't know how to interpret that data. You see, we know it because we've learned how to interpret those sorts of things. All right, so that's why you have, that's why the observer is a key element in quantum mechanics is because it's a virtual reality and our reality is defined in the mind of the observer. You don't have an observer, there's no measurement. Reality is not defined. And I often talk about that in my lectures in terms of you, you um, let's say a, an astronomer. Okay, an astronomer takes a microscope, or not a microscope, but a telescope, and it's the best telescope ever just been invented, sees farther and better than any telescope ever before, so they're going to see things that nobody's ever seen before. So they take that telescope and they point it up into a particularly interesting part of the sky and they look at it and what is it they're going to see? Well, there's about, I don't know, a thousand different things that might be there as far as probability goes. It has to be consistent with what they've already seen because that's here. But it could be different. It may not just be all the same. It could be something else. And there's probably a thousand things that would be consistent with what they've already seen that it could be. Well, which one of those thousand are they going to get? Well, the way reality works is that there's this probability distribution of all the possibilities. I don't know if I'm, those of you who are not mathy, maybe this is hard. But there's this probability distribution. That means that there's a there's a curve <coughs> that says this possibility is this probable. This other possibility is that probable. Now here's this other possibility and it's only that probable. You see all the possibilities and their probability that they might be drawn. Well, a random draw means that you go into this big probability distribution and there's you think of a raffle. You know, have a raffle where they're going to, you know, you buy a ticket and then you, they, all the tickets go in the box and you pick one out and that person wins a prize? Okay. That's a random draw, right? A random draw from all the possibilities in the box. And hopefully all the possibilities in the box are one name, one person each, right? Well, with this, if the probability of an event being, being actualized is big, then there's a lot of of tags in the box with that event written on it. So this event says is, is, there's a hundred pieces of paper in the box that has this event on it. Because this one is a low probability, there's only ten pieces of paper in the box that has that probability on it. And maybe only one piece of paper in a box that has this little tiny probability on it. You see? So that's what I mean by distribution of the probabilities. You reach into that box and you pull out one. It's most likely to be one of the ones that were more likely, right? One that had big probabilities. But it could be that one like that. It could be. Very unusual. So that's how you know what that astronomer sees. There's a thousand things he might see that are consistent. You reach into that box of those thousand things all having different probabilities. You pull one out and that's what he sees. That now is reality. Once he sees it, he takes his picture, you know, he makes his measurement. Now anybody else that looks there will see that. Now he moves his telescope a little further over. It's going to be something else nobody's ever seen, but he knows what's next to it. So now instead of a thousand different things could be there, there may only be 700 because now they also have to be consistent with what he just saw. You see, we can't have any inconsistencies. So the more measurements you make, the more well-defined your reality becomes. The less wiggle room there is there to get something that's different. Okay. So you see uncertainty is a key thing here. Where there's lots of uncertainty, there's lots of possibilities. Where there's not much uncertainty, there's only a few, there's only a few possibilities. Okay. The way this double slit experiment works 
is there's only two possibilities. They either become a diffraction pattern or they hit behind the slits. There's only two outcomes. It's a binary distribution. If, the, if they have which way data, then the probability of it being a, a uh, diffraction pattern is zero. The probability of it hitting right behind the slit is a one. So you pull out of that, you'll get one or the other. You see, it's a very simple thing. It's a binary. So there's this, these virtual slits and the virtual light source and the virtual, all of that stuff really can be reduced to a simple binary draw, a random draw from a binary distribution based on the data at hand. And part of that data is what has been observed here, what's fact here, and what's still probability. Well, here's all the probabilities, and out of those probabilities, it has to be consistent with the facts. You take a draw, and that's what you get. See? So when it's only one of two choices, you're drawing from a binary distribution. If there's 10 choices, then there's 10 lumps in your distribution, not just two. So that's how that works. Um, let's see. <coughs> a couple of other things I wanted to wind up the science. Um, Okay, now we're going to try to work ourselves into more of the spirituality part of it. <coughs> so we know why this virtual reality is here. This virtual reality is here because individuated units of consciousness needed to evolve the quality of their consciousness. That is, need to lower their entropy. And this, gave this rule set that created this evolved <coughs> simulation now remember, that's the difference between World of Warcraft. That was a programmed simulation. This simulation evolved. Remember the big digital bang? So it was an evolved thing. <coughs> okay. So let's go back to the entropy. So we're going to find the, the purpose. Okay, okay so it makes, it, it makes them evolve. But what's the nature of this evolution? Okay, well, there's two opposite sides to the way that you can evolve with consciousness. <clears throat> you can either raise entropy or you can lower entropy. Okay, now what does that mean in our terms? <clears throat> with all of these individuated units of consciousness interacting with each other, what you have is a social system, right? Each individuated unit of consciousness is an aware, thinking, feeling entity. They're exchanging information. You have a social system. <clears throat> so I'm going to give two examples um, of the opposites here, and you'll see immediately what the connection is. We're going to take a bunch of these individuated unit of consciousness. We take 10,000 of them or 100,000 of them. Okay, we're going to make an experiment. So over here's 100,000, and over here's 100,000. You know, A and B, if you like. Okay, now group A is going to be fear-based, okay? They're fearful. When you have fear, you don't have trust. When you don't have trust, you don't have cooperation. <clears throat> when you don't have cooperation, you don't have caring. You don't have empathy. You don't have those things. And I don't mean you don't have them at all, but I mean you have less of them, <clears throat> okay? So how would this, we're going to give these, both of these, A and B, we're going to give them both the same amount of resources, the same amount of intelligence, ability, function, everything's going to be identical to start with. But this group's going to be fear-based, and this group's going to be love-based. So now let's look at that fear-based group. What are they going to do? How are they going to interact? Well, fear-based, fear is about yourself. It's all about me. That's fear. Fear is self-focused. So what they will do is they're going to try to grab whatever those resources they can, figure out how they can keep them and keep somebody else from taking them away from them. They'll be very self-centered. Um, they'll, you know, it'll be a what about me and mine, you know, and the people that depend on me and whatever, my tribe, if you like. They will um, very quickly realize that the best way to keep others from taking what they've grabbed is if they team up with other people because there's power in numbers. Because now if there's 10 of them together, well, that's like a defense pack and other people won't take their stuff because there's 10 of them. 
but guess what? They can take other people's stuff because there's 10 of them, you see? So then other ones group up. Now there's 100 of these. So these get bigger and so on. What happens is that they will divide up into blocks of power, of self-protection power, and they will fight with each other constantly to get each other's stuff and just because they want to win. It's very self-centered. It's focused on me. Okay, well, that's the fear group. So what are they going to do with the resources they've got in, say, they have 100 years to deal with it? Not much, right? What do you expect? You'd expect just about like where we live, right? It's an awful lot like us. We group up into power blocks. We fight with each other. We're constantly struggling. It's all about us. And that's what we have here. Here, somebody comes up in the fear group with a good idea, some invention. Do they share it? No. No, they hide it. They'll sell it, maybe, or lease it, or somehow they want to benefit from it. It's theirs. Now, let's look at this other group. This is the love, this is the love group. The love group is all about caring. It's not about self. Love is about other. All love is unconditional. If there's conditions, it's not love. So here's this ba group based on love. Now what are they gonna do with their resources? Well, they're gonna try to construct and build something that's useful to all of them. They're gonna care that everybody gets some of what's available. They're going to build structures and they will cooperate to build these structures. They will have trust, they will have caring, they'll have empathy, they'll have compassion, and they will make the most of their resources in the time that they've got. So if you look at both of these 100 years later, these will be a bunch of power brokers fighting with each other. These will have maximized the potential that they had. That's the love and the fear sides. So why are we here? What are we individuated units of consciousness supposed to do? We're supposed to lower our entropy. Well, which one of these two do you think had the lower entropy? Which one had the most construction, the most uh, building, the most, you know, the most structure? You remember order and disorder is entropy? Well, they're going to have a lot less disorder over here in the love group. They're very structured. They've optimized their resources for everyone. Over here, very suboptimal. As soon as somebody builds up something, somebody else will figure out how to take it away from them. You're never king of the hill very long. <coughs> Things are constantly being torn down. There's nothing that you can build that, that uh, will last very long because other people will want it their way and they'll get it and they'll tear it down eventually. So it's always building and rebuilding and tearing down and fighting and struggling and competing. You see, that's high entropy. That doesn't result in optimal configuration this does so now how does that translate that says that we're here to evolve the quality of our consciousness lower our entropy which means becoming love See, that's what it means to lower your entropy lowering your entropy in this consciousness evolution means becoming love we're supposed to grow up we're here to make choices and interact with each other so that every choice we make if it's a choice that's about love, we evolve the quality of our consciousness. If it's a choice based on fear, we de-evolve the quality of our consciousness. <clears throat> now this larger consciousness system is just all of us. We all together make up this larger consciousness system, plus it also has a, you know, the operating system, if you will. You know, there has to be an executive part that kind of keeps track of everything and makes the rules. <clears throat> develops the simulations, but we are it, it's us. As we evolve, it evolves. We are a large part of the larger consciousness system strategy to evolve. Break yourself into pieces, let the pieces interact, give them a, a virtual reality trainer so that their interactions have consequences so that they can tell good decisions from bad decisions and grow up and become love. Well, in this trainer, if you do that, if you make your decisions based on other, cooperation, caring, compassion, all those things that are positive, you will be a very happy person here. 
your life will be wonderful. You'll feel good. Things will work out for you. You see, because that's how you win the game. That's the point of the game. <coughs> it's becoming love is the name of the game. Whereas if you're self-centered and self-focused and it's all about you and how much you can get and grab and hold, you will be miserable. You'll be unhappy. You'll be frustrated. You'll constantly be struggling and struggling and struggling and can't seem to ever get out from under the, the struggle <coughs> because you're not playing the game right. That's not what this reality is about. This reality is an entropy reduction trainer for individuated units of consciousness. Just like pilots go into a flight trainer before anybody ever puts them you know, in the cockpit of a $3 million aircraft. They spend a lot of time training. Well, that's what we're here for. So now we've just taken the leap from science into love, into metaphysics, okay, into spirituality. That's our point. We are the system strategy for evolving. Now this system, larger, <coughs> larger consciousness system, it is not perfect. It's just a natural system. It's not done, it's still evolving. Evolution is open-ended. You never get to the end in evolution. Any place you are will change to something else as the environment or circumstances change. So it's an open-ended, constantly changing, growing, lowering its entropy sort of thing. <clears throat> Reducing your entropy to zero is not something that happens because you can only approach zero, just like you can only approach the speed of light. You can't get there. You'll never end up perfect to where I don't have to grow up anymore because I've grown up, right? I'm enlightened. I've grown up. There's no more growing I have to do. I'm done. That isn't going to happen. This is evolution. This is entropy reduction. You're never done because as soon as you think you're done, that's the first step toward being undone. <laughs> <laughs> you see? Because the point here is to love and to care and to give. And when it's, oh, I'm done, that's all about you. Where's the caring and the love and the giving? And I'm done. You see, you're never done. As long as there's somebody who could use some help, as long as there's something you can contribute, as long as there's something you can add to the system as far as lowering the entropy a little bit, you're not done. If you get to the point where, let's say, your entropy is very low and you're feeling kind of done, <clears throat> and you just kind of kick back, and, you know, decide you're going to play a harp on a cloud or something and just hang out for a while, you're going to stop working, what happens is that you start to de-evolve because lowering entropy always takes effort. And if you don't put in the effort, you start to slide backwards. Lowering entropy always takes effort. So, no, you know, it's like maintenance on your house. If you never do any maintenance on your home, eventually it'll fall apart. It takes effort. Why does it fall apart? Because entropy increases. In the physical world, entropy is still disorder. Things rot, things go away. You know, structures give, they leak. And as they leak, they, they, they devolve quicker, you see. So if you don't keep doing maintenance, everything, will dissipate. That's the second law of thermodynamics in physics, that everything dissipates. Entropy is always increasing in natural, irreversible processes, which is what life is. So yes, you can reduce entropy, but it takes effort. You gotta put energy into it. And as soon as you quit, it starts sliding the other way. So you're never done. You're never so grown up that you don't need to keep working on it. You're never so, grown that you don't have to give back, you don't have to help, you don't have to be engaged. That's not the way it works. So, <clears throat> let's see. All right, another, I have to <coughs> kind of move along because I've got a lot of things to get to here and then we'll do questions. Hopefully after lunch, most of that time will be available for questions. I want to give you like two or three hours for questions because I know there's at least two or three hours worth of questions out there. Um, okay, so we, now we understand who we are. We're individuated units of consciousness. 
what this reality is, it's a virtual reality for us to make choices in, and what the purpose is. Our purpose is to grow up and become love. Okay. So we talk about morality, you know, what's good and bad. Well, what's good is what lowers the entropy in the long term, and what's bad and evil is what increases entropy in the long term. So now you have a scientific definition for morality, depending on you know, what things are good and things aren't. Okay, now you won't always know what your actions, what, how they'll lower entropy or raise entropy, so you always be authentic, do the best you can, and then you learn from what happens. You see, it's all about being aware of the feedback you get here, the circumstances. That's why we're here in this trainer. We get feedback. We should look at that feedback and see, are we lowering entropy or are we raising it? Are we helping or are we constantly wanting help, wanting somebody to help us? What's, you know, what is my life like? You can take a good sense of yourself. Okay, so that's the, that's how science kind of rolls into, into love and into spirituality. And it's all part of the same logical process. So we take that virtual reality, and from that, we can do better physics. So it's better science. And not just poetry, but it's better left brain science. And I've got six new uh, quantum mechanics experiments waiting to be done now. Hopefully, I get a university interested in doing them. And they all are kind of similar to the double slit experiment, except they're even more dramatic. They not only say, this is not a materialistic reality, they say quite clearly, this is a virtual reality and consciousness is the computer. So those will hopefully get done and kind of make a, be like throwing a grenade under the tent of science. It will cause a lot of trouble, but. <clears throat> Okay, so let's, how do we apply this? And, you know, so what does it mean to us? Well, now if we see our purpose, and we see what we're here for, and we kind of see the bigger picture, what can we do about it? Well, we're here to grow up. We're here to get rid of our fear. Fear creates two things in us, two, two things that are generally uh, obvious. And one is ego, and the other is belief. Okay. So both are products of fear. I define ego as awareness in the service of fear. <clears throat> and you might think that's a different definition of ego than what Freud gave to ego, but it's not. It's exactly the same. Freud was looking at a lot of people. His, his definition of ego wasn't theoretical. It was because he was an experimentalist. He, he looked at lots of people. And he saw that this sense of self, this sense of me, you know, what about me and then keeping me straight? He saw that that was real common. Everybody had it. People who were successful, held jobs, had families, were doing just fine, had this ego. So he said, okay, this, this sense of I is an important part of the psyche and it's a good thing, it's necessary. What he didn't know is that almost everybody, everywhere in every culture, is right up to here in ego, I mean in fear. They're all full of fear. So yes, it was very normal to find people who were self-centered and self-focused, but that doesn't make it helpful. It just makes it typical, makes it normal, makes it average, you see. Interesting thing about this ego is that when you get rid of your fear and, and the Freudian model, you, you, uh, when you get rid of fear, you no longer have a subconscious. That subconscious is there because of all the things you really don't want to deal with, things that are difficult, things that are sticky, things that aren't, you know, don't make you feel good or may give you stress or anxiety, that kind of stuff. So we stuff them away where we don't have to deal with them. That's the ego's job is to make us kind of get along with our fear. It, it puts a barrier up between us and our fear. That's the ego's 
purpose. Okay. So Freud did see a lot of normal people who seemed to be healthy and happy, who had strong egos, but he didn't realize that from a bigger picture, those people were all really dysfunctional. They were all struggling, as are most of us. You see, we all have egos. How do you know you have ego? If your life is not full of joy and love and peace all the time, you've got ego, you've got fear. Because if you didn't, your life would be full of joy and peace and satisfaction all the time. So if you get stressed, if you get upset, if you get angry, that's your fear. Fears are hard to find. We have fears that we have no idea. We picked up a lot of them when we were three years old, you know, things that happened. We bring some of them forward from the last lifetime. We have fears that we cannot name, but they're there. We have beliefs that we cannot name. Mostly, we have a lot of beliefs around materialism and this reality and how it works. That's why it's so hard to grasp this idea of living in a virtual reality, because we just believe that this physical stuff is primary and that's what's real. That's a belief. Okay, we have cultural beliefs. We have religious beliefs. We have scientific beliefs. Materialism is a scientific belief. Okay. Beliefs are often unseen, but you'd be surprised how many of both you have, of both the, both the fears and the beliefs. But ego is right up there in front of us. Ego is easy to find. So how do you deal with fear? How do you get rid of these beliefs and these fears and become a being of love? And I'm saying become a being of love, not act like a being of love. We're not talking about behavior. Behavior, better behavior is civilizing and everybody appreciates it when you behave nicely, but that's not where growth comes from. Growth comes at the being level. You have to be love, not just act loving. There's a difference. The act loving comes out of this intellect, mostly run by ego because you're doing what you think you should do, which means you're avoiding guilt, you're avoiding fear, you're avoiding the things you know you shouldn't, you know, those, those negative things. So that's the acting. We don't want to act it. We have to be it. When we be differently, we become a different person. If we act differently, we're the same person we were before. We just improved our, our action some. So fears are mostly invisible. Beliefs are mostly invisible. But ego is right up front and center. Because every time you feel anxiety, stress, anger, upset, annoyed, irritated, which is for most of us, like, you know, every hour or so, we feel that way. <clears throat> That's ego. And that ego is attached to a fear. If you ask, why do you have that anger? What you most people will say, oh, I'm angry because she made me angry. He made me angry. The boss made me angry. You know, the social system made me angry. Uh, you know, every, everything makes me angry, you see. Politics makes me angry. Anger is a choice. You have to take responsibility for your choices. Your anger is your choice. You have other choices. Anger isn't the only choice you have. It seems that way because your ego and your fear get, make your decision space small. Decision space is a thing we haven't talked about yet. Free will, you have free will to make choices. And an array of all of those choices that you have to make is what I call your decision space. So let's say that the way I act or I respond to something, let's say somebody says something really rude to me and I have now choices. So if, I have, if I'm a low entropy being, I have a lot more choices. I can react in a lot of different ways. If I'm full of fear, and therefore full of ego, now my choices can get reduced. Now these are not theoretical choices, I mean the choices that you have access to. So the fear reduces your choices. So you say, that person made me angry. Well, that was just your reaction to that person, and anger was the only, was the only thing that was in your decision space. Well, that's because 
your fear limits your decision space. As you let go of that fear, your decision space gets bigger. You live in a bigger reality with more choices. You keep living in a bigger and bigger reality. And pretty soon, as you keep lowering that entry, that, that uh, entropy, the reality you live in is much bigger than this physical reality. You begin living in a reality that is as much non-physical as physical. Okay. It's not like you have to go meditate to get into that non-physical space. Your life becomes a meditation. You're connected to the larger conscious system all the time and you're connected here interacting all the time and your decision space is just a lot bigger. But the more fear you have, the smaller and smaller and smaller that decision space gets. So, <coughs> nobody makes you angry. You choose to be angry, you see? And you may have very limited choices, but that can be fixed. So how do we apply it to ourselves? First, we look at that ego. Ego is about you, okay? It's self-focused, it's self-centered, it's what you want. And we rearrange that to what we know is right. Well, this is not really about me. I just happen to know the way you should be, you see. I happen to know how you should act. So it's not really about me. It's about me helping you act the way I know is better for you to act because I know these things, you see. That's ego. It's about you. It's about you imposing yourself on another's free will choices. So when it's, <clears throat> we trick ourselves with, I'm not angry, they make me angry. So it's not my fault. Uh, it's not about me. I really care about everybody else. But, uh, you know, they just need to straighten up. They need to do this, they need to do that. You know, and where does this action take place most? Well, it takes place at our most significant relationships. Relationship is the key. It's in those significant relationships with your significant others, be that your spouse or your children or your parents, whoever those significant others are in your life. That's where the rubber meets the road with ego and fear. That's where it's tough to make love-based choices. That's where you know if they just did it differently, everything would be fine, right? If your husband would just not throw his underwear and his socks on the floor all the time, if he just put them in the dirty clothes, I mean, how much trouble is that? My life would be so much better, you know. We have these things that we, we know how other people should be. So what we do in life is we try to manipulate our environment and the people in our environment to be the way we know they ought to be, which is the way we'd like them to be. We want them to be the way we want. Well, that's really all about us. It's not about them. It's about us. So that's where we spend our time. How do we make the boss see us in a way that he'll want to give us a raise? How do we make our spouse do the things that we really want them to do? How do we make our children act the way we want them to act? How do we manipulate the world to be the way we want it to be, which of course is defined as the way it should be, you know, the way it's right. Okay. Manipulation, we want to fix everything to be the way we want it. And that's how we spend almost 90% of our energy is in manipulating the world to be the way we want it. Matter of fact, most people will hear that and they'll say, well, yeah, of course. If you don't, It'll go to hell in a handbasket. It'll just be awful if you don't keep it the, you know, the way it ought to be. That's the only thing that holds it together is my constant effort to make it be the way I want it. Well, what you'll find out is it's actually just the opposite of that. Your constant effort to make it be the way you want it will prevent it from being the way that it's best both for you and for the other people. It's like people who are trying to stuff too many clothes into a suitcase. You know, and you have all these clothes and they don't quite fit. So you make a crack here and you stuff something in, but something falls out on the other side. So you go around to the other side and you stuff that in and then something falls out, you know, in the middle. And you keep trying to do it and you just can never get there. Well, that's the way most people go through life. 
the struggle to manipulate their reality to be the way they would like it to be. Very self-focused, actually, even though we claim it's, we're just helping others be the way we know they should be. We don't let them take that responsibility on themselves to be the way they are. We want them to be the way we know is best for them. You see, the self-focus. So, if we give up that idea, and instead of trying to fix the future to be the way we want it, let's just look at the present. And instead of manipulating us, let's focus on our choices. Now the model is, isn't how can I fix everything to be the way they want, it's stuff happens and I have to deal with it. Okay? Things just happen and I have to deal with it. People are just being the way people are. I'm not trying to make them be any particular way. I just deal with the way they are. And my choices of how to deal with it will either raise my entropy or lower my entropy. Every choice. And it's not just the big choices, it's all the little choices all go together. Matter of fact, you are the sum of all your choices. It's who you are sitting there right now. Who you are as a human being is a result of all the choices you've made from the very beginning. They have accumulated into you, your choices. And what you're going to be five years from now is going to be all the choices you're going to make between now and five years from now. You can become however, whatever you want. You can become love if you can let go of that fear. Now, a nice thing about becoming love is that you don't, know how, you don't have to know how to become love. All you have to do is get rid of the fear. Once you get rid of the fear, you are love. That's what's left, you see. You get rid of the stuff that creates the high entropy, what's left is low entropy. So it's not a special thing you need to know. So the ego will lead us to the fear. The ego we can find every time we are dissatisfied, unhappy, angry, annoyed, frustrated, all of those negative feelings. Every time you feel it, think, oh, that's a fear. What is that fear? Well, the fear is that the boss will overlook me and won't appreciate all the great work I do. So I need to manipulate the boss to make sure he understands that I'm better than the guy that sits over here on the other desk. Now, how do I go about doing that manipulation? Well, if I'm a high entropy person, maybe I'll help this other guy fail. You see, maybe I'll steal his report the day before he hands it in, and then he'll be late because he'll have to make another one, you see. So I might do things like that. Or if I'm not so high entropy, I may just try to always get in front of the boss every time I can and, you know, smile at him and, you know, buying presents, you know, take him out to play golf or whatever he likes to do and try to get in with him. What do we call that? Brown nosing, right? It's kind of suck up to the boss as much as I can. You see, all of that is self-focused. And the boss knows that too. You see, it doesn't do you any good. And if it does do you good, you were probably better off not being so close to the boss. You see? So anyway, that's, your, that's your, your, your game now that you're in. You're a player and you're in a game. And how do you win the game? You become love. How do you do that? You get rid of fear. And how do you do that? You find your fear because of your ego. Ego's easy. Find that fear and say, and the first thing you have to do is own it. You have to say, okay, I'm afraid that I'll be overlooked and I won't be appreciated, and you'll find that's coming out of a fear of being insecure, inadequate, not quite as good as the other people. That's where that fear is coming from. And you say, all right, I've traced it back to the fear, and I feel inadequate. I just don't feel like I measure up. Other people are just better than I am at everything. I own it. You say, all right, that's me. I'll just be myself. I'll be authentic. I'm just going to be me. I'm not going to try to keep patching it up and acting like this and acting like that, trying to be the hit of the party and make all the jokes so the people will notice me because I know really I'm inadequate and nobody would really notice me. You see, that's the fear. So just stop all the uh, feeding of that fear 
own it, be it. Say, all right, I'm inadequate. I'll just be inadequate, but I'll be me. I won't try to convince anybody of any different. I'll just accept that the way it comes. However that inadequacy plays out, I'll accept it. That's first step, owning it. Now you're being it, you're being honest, you're being authentic, you are who you are. Now look around at the results. Now you look at the feedback. How does how you are work? What happens when you are how you are? Now you have a chance to change how you are. You see, you can't change how you are if you don't own how you are. You can't change things you don't own. As long as you deny it, oh, I'm not like that. That's not the reason. The boss just doesn't like me. That's why. Just doesn't like people like me. Or I got off on the wrong side of it. Make up some other kind of reason why it is other than us. So just be who you are. Look at the results and change. Be some other way. Change takes courage. Being who you are takes courage. So what's the key here? It's courage. To be yourself is scary. That's why you have the fear. You're afraid of being that way. That's the whole point of your fear. It takes courage to be authentic, and then it takes courage to change and be somewhere else. Most people would rather remain inauthentic rather than change because change is scary. If I change, what will I be? Will people like me? Will I be shunned? You know, if I'm just me, maybe that's not going to be good enough. Well, you have to face that. Courage. There is no easy way. You don't become love just by waiting for it to happen. It won't happen. You have to reach out, grab the opportunity, find the ego, lead it, let it lead you to the fear, face that fear and own it, live it authentically, accept whatever happens, you know, let the chips fall where they may. This is me. Find out who you are. Most of us have no idea who we are. We live through our egos and our beliefs. Then you can change who you are just by wanting to, just by will. I'm going to do something differently. When people are rude to me like that, rather than me getting angry, I'm going to try to understand their rudeness and why they act that way. What is it? There's some pain in them that makes them like that. How can I help that pain? What can I do that makes them feel better about that, that doesn't push that button? You see, how can I fix that? That's the response. Instead of anger, you might go over and say something kind to them or ask them, uh, you know, what it is that's, that's upsetting. What, what, you know, what have I done? What can I do to help? What can I make you feel better? That sort of thing. And if they think you're being authentic, then they will be taken aback, but their anger will dissipate very quickly. It'll go away. Because what they're expecting is you to be angry back to their anger, you see. Fear creates fear, and that's what they were expecting. If you don't give them that back, you've really knocked them off balance, and now they're going, hmm, what's going on here? They'll reassess. You come back angry, they'll just reinforce, not reassess. So that's how you apply this. It's all about becoming love. It's your job here. You're an individuated unit of consciousness, and you have a mission. And that's to grow up, get rid of your fear. So that kind of wraps it all up in a, you know, and why am I here? What am I supposed to do? How do I go after it? You got to get rid of the fear. That's the thing. Now I've had any number of, of particularly, it's, it's usually young guys come up to me, you know, like 22 year old guys and they'll come up and they'll say, Tom, as far as I know, I don't have any fear. I don't have any beliefs. You know, I've never been religious, never got into beliefs. I don't have any beliefs, and there's nothing really that you know, frightens me. What should I do? And I say, well, have you ever been upset? Yeah, all the time. <laughs> right? Yeah, I get angry, and you know, lots of things make me angry, you know, upset me, give me stress. And, and I said, well, there's your fear. Go work on that. Try to find it. I hear back from them in six months or so, and they're overwhelmed. They say, Tom, I've been working on the fear, 
And I found that every decision I've made my whole life has been based on my fear. I haven't done anything in my life, any choice I've ever made in my life, it's because of my fear has driven me to do that. And they're totally overwhelmed with fear. And I tell them, just pick one, an easy one. Just pick a small fear, something that you found that, that maybe annoys, you know, maybe it's not anger, maybe it's just annoyance. I said, and work on that one. That one comes up and you get annoyed, stop and say, ah, don't want to go there. Being annoyed is not a helpful choice. It's not going to make the situation better. It's not going to improve the person that's annoying me. It's not going to improve me. It's a wrong choice, dysfunctional. I'm not going to go there. And okay, <coughs> that's not at the being level yet. That's at the intellect. But that's the first step. And if you keep doing that, and if you have this intent to do that, you will eventually get rid of that fear. And then those things that used to annoy you just won't annoy you anymore. See, now you're one step closer to that happiness and joy that I promised. And you keep doing that with all of your fears, and then eventually you live in a very wonderful place that's interesting, it's exciting, it's fun, relationships are terrific, you see, and life just becomes a game. You really are the player now. And stuff happens, and you get to deal with it. It's exciting. It's a great game. And it's fun to play. Instead of being ground down by the constant struggle and struggle and struggle to make it be the way you want it to be, the way you know is right. Okay. So that's kind of the overall picture. That's how you deal with it. That's where you want to go. Now, it's real easy for me to stand up here and tell you this. It's not nearly so easy for you to actually do it. But I will tell you that the first fear that you beat will be the hardest. The first fear that you find, even, tracing it back from your ego, will be the hardest. The more you do it, the easier it gets. And every time you get rid of a fear, you feel lighter. You feel more alive. You feel relieved. It's just like somebody's taking a load off. And that makes it easier to get rid of the next one because you know that it works and you know how it feels. And in a couple of years or, you know, a couple of decades, however long it takes, everybody's different, then, you know, you'll be a completely different person. And if you're not sure how you're doing, ask those people who are close to you. And if you've really been growing, they will notice the change immediately. Because you'll no longer be trying to make them be the way you want them to be. You'll let them be who they are. And they'll then tend to let you be who you are. So the, the next thing I'd want to talk about is, well, how do you help? How do you help fix this world? How do you, how do you save the world? How do you help others? The best thing you can do to help the world and help others is to get rid of your own fear. That's your maximum contribution you can make. You get rid of your fear, and remember, we're all, we're all netted. This consciousness, we're all netted. We all, you know, if you're a new ager, you say vibes, you know, good vibes. I get good vibes from that person. I get bad vibes from that person. That's just a metaphor for we sense people. We can get messages. We get connections with them. And as you get rid of the fear, those senses get better and better and better. Your intuition gets more and more reliable and better. Your relationships all get better. Your understanding of others gets better. You no longer feel like you need to fix them. You're perfectly willing just to give them a safe space and a lot of love and let them fix themselves. Because you can't fix them. They can only fix themselves. Growth has to come from the inside out. It can't be imposed from the outside in. You can't lecture people on how they should act better and expect that'll make any difference. They may act better just to get you to stop lecturing, but they won't be any better. And in fact, they'll resent you for forcing them to act a way that's not them. People don't like to be forced to act in a way other than the way they want to act. 
So see, your maximum contribution to this world, to yourself, to the larger conscious system, is to grow up, fix yourself, get rid of that fear. If you do that, you will help every, everybody grow up. Okay, so let's say you have a spouse or significant other or a child or something that you'd like to help them grow up. You really want to because you love them and you want them to grow up. How do you do that? Well, lecturing is not the way. Obviously, nagging is not the way. Explaining why they irritate you is not the way. Of course, you're grown up, you're not irritated. Explaining to them what they, you know, how they should be is not the way. They have to be themselves. What you can do is give them an environment in which they can grow themselves. You have to, everybody has to grow themselves up. It's always from the inside out. Lecturing doesn't help. So you give them an environment. What, what is an environment that makes them so they can grow up? It's a safe space. Remember the way you grow up, it takes courage, courage, and courage. Well, it's hard to go out and do things that are scary if you don't feel safe. If you feel like anytime I mess up, <clears throat> I'm gone. You know, if I mess up, if I do it wrong, it's a really big problem. But when you love people unconditionally, they don't feel that way. It's unconditional. You're just loved unconditionally. You know you have now the strength to stretch that boundary a little bit, to take that chance, to find that courage, because it won't matter as far as that person loving you. It's unconditional. You see, so if you give people, you give that special someone that kind of love, and that's really the only kind of love there is, then they will tend to start to grow up make better choices because now there's positive stuff coming their way instead of this they're always doing this they're always doing that when are they going to change so you get all that negative stuff coming in their direction what does that do it makes them kind of hunker down and get defensive well when you're hunkered down and getting defensive you're not growing you're not finding fears you're creating new fears you're helping that person not grow up by having all that negative attitude toward them, you see? Now, will everybody grow up if you give them that environment? Not necessarily, most people will. The average person, if you give them that kind of environment, they will begin to grow up, okay? Some people won't. Some people are so far descended into fear that they won't grow up at all. And in fact, what they may do is go, ha, I can take advantage of this, you see? And that's all right. When you give love, you don't care about that. It's, it's given. It's freely given. It's not like I'll give as long as you give back. And you stop giving back, then I'll stop. That's not love. That's a deal. That's a bargain. It's not love at all. In fact, most of us never fall in love. We fall in need. We find people that meet our needs, and we meet their needs, and that's what we call love. But all love is unconditional. So if you have a person who just doesn't seem to have the potential to grow up, well, the best thing to do then is, you know, if you can, remove yourself from that relationship. If you can't, then treat that relationship professionally <laughs> instead of personally, right? We all have professional relationships with the people at work that annoy us, right? But we get along with them anyway because we know we have to work with them. So even though they really annoy us, we smile, we cooperate, we share, we do all the things we need to do at work in order to make the work work, but we don't get personal. It's strictly professional. We, we just interact the way we have to interact, cooperate the way we have to cooperate, smile, be pleasant. That's what I mean by being professional. If you have to, because those people maybe are your parents or your, you know, child or something that's maybe it's your 30 year old child or something like that so you can't just get rid of a relationship because it doesn't they don't seem to be growing some relationships you have responsibility there that runs for a long time but you can get professional to where you deal with it in a way that you're not feeding negativity to it you see if it upsets you and annoys you, now you're feeding negativity to it, and now you're part of the problem, not part of the solution. 
if you nag, if you scold, if you do this, you become part of the problem. So that's kind of our goal here, is to remove ourselves from being part of the problem and put ourselves into being part of the solution. Get rid of our fear, become love. That's what it's all about. Now there's a couple of things that, uh, that some of you will be interested in that I'd like to move on to next. And that is one of the, one of the properties of this, this um, learning lab that we're all in is that your intent modifies future probability. Okay? That's part of our feedback. That's built right into the system. Why? Because then the reality we create here is an absolute perfect likeness of us, right? This reality is us. So if you look at the reality in the world, you know, look at all the stuff you get on the news. What is this reality like? That's what people are like. That's a, that's a very accurate description of humanity and the quality of consciousness of humanity. Not a pretty picture, but that's us. Okay, we get to make this reality in several ways. One, we just get data. We have to interpret it. Same with World of Warcraft. You just send data to your computers, a bunch of little lights on a screen, you get to interpret it. Okay, so how we interpret it is what our reality is. It's our interpretation of the data is our reality. So everybody here has their own reality. There's not just one reality that we all share. There's parts of this reality that we all share because we interact. But our reality is personal. Your reality and my reality and you know, person outside's reality are all different. If we all come from the same culture, we're all about the same age, then our realities are probably pretty similar. But if we come from very different cultures, we're at different ages, grown up different places, different kinds of situations, then the way we interpret the data is very different. When you go out into the larger consciousness system and start interacting with what's out there, well, what kind of, you know, how do you interpret that data? That data is like no other data you've experienced before. The way you <coughs> interpret it is a little bit at a time. You learn. You experiment, and you try again, and you repeat, and you see what changes what, and you just have to learn how that is over time. Okay, so our interpretation changes our reality. So these other people that aren't doing what you want, it's because they don't live in your reality. <laughs> they don't see, they don't interpret it the way you do. Men and women don't live in the same reality. We interpret things differently. Same information gets a different interpretation. Okay, but everybody is unique in the reality that they live in, and we have to respect everybody else's reality. Everybody here and everybody on this planet is basically, with few exceptions, <coughs> they're doing the best they can with what they've got. What they've got is whatever level of of quality, which is just entropy reduction, that they've managed to create over however many lifetimes they've been creating it. So that's what they are. All the choices they've ever made in all their lives kind of lead up to this. That's what they've got to work with. And they're doing the best they can with what they've got. And so are you, so am I. You see, that's what we're doing. And when we see it that way, we don't really need to control them to make them more like us. So they think the way we do, of course, that's the right way, right? The way we think is the way it ought to be. We can just let them be who they are. And if they're struggling and you can see that they're doing things that hurt themselves, they're doing things that are just not productive and not helpful, well, if they're adults, you kind of have to let them be. That's the path they're on. That's their thing. You can love them. You can support them, but you can't make them any different than what they are. They are what they are. But you can have compassion for them if they're struggling. Care about them, but still let them be. Now, if they're your child, it's a little different. With children, we do override their free will. When they're little, 
They're three years old, they want to play in the street. We say no. They open the gate anyway, we put a lock on it. You see, or we make it the fence higher so they can't climb over it. We do override their free will because they're very young and they can't make good choices. They don't have enough experience yet to make good choices. But by the time your children are 10 or 11, there are, you have to give them a lot more choices that they can make. There's still some they can't make at that age that you have to make for them. But you give them more freedom to make choices. And doing it the way I think it ought to be done is not the choices they need to make. That's the, that's the choice to obey. Where do they learn how to make good choices if they only can make one choice and that's to obey, you see? And by the time they're 20 and 21 and 22, well, they have to learn from their own mistakes. You can't, you can't make choices for them anymore. You can't put a lock on the gate. If they're gonna go play in the street, they're gonna go play in the street. All you can do then is tell them that you love them, give them some options, explain to them, well, here's what happens if you play in the street. Here are some of the things that may happen to you, good things and bad things. It'll be a lot of fun because, you know, there's more room to run around, but you might get run over by a car or a bicycle or something because you're too focused and you're not paying attention. So you explain life to them as best you can from your experience, and then you let them go do it make their own choices with guidance, you see. A parent needs to learn to give guidance, not orders, as appropriate as the children grow up. And you need to only give guidance to anybody else, and usually only when they ask for it. If they don't ask for it, then giving them unasked for guidance generally will make things worse rather than better. But if you're clever, you can maybe get them to ask for it. Yeah, you can maybe help that. But you have to not just tell them that here's what you need to be doing. Where we left off was uh, we're going to talk about modifying future reality with your intent. Uh, all right, that's better. Okay. <clears throat> We're going to talk about modifying future reality with your intent. As I said, this is just a feature of the rule set. It's there because it gives us feedback. It helps us create, it helps us, it forces us to live in a reality of our own creation, which is pretty good feedback. And it allows us to do a lot of interesting things. First, I'll have to say that there's intent at two levels. You have intent at an intellectual level. I intend to, you know, go to the lecture tomorrow. I intend to go get a drink or something. That's an intention. That's not what I'm talking about. That's an intellectual intent. I'm talking about intent at the being level. It's what you intend to do. It's the choices you intend to make. It's the motive <clears throat> or the uh, reason why okay. that you make the choices. So intent is the first thing. Intent is the motive force within consciousness. Consciousness is a lot of entities communicating with each other. You need an intent to communicate before you communicate. Intent is the mover. It's the motive force. It's the energy, if you will, in the non-physical. <clears throat> it's what changes things. Now, this virtual reality uh, was constructed to be, <coughs> to be a good learning tool. And it has a couple of databases that are available. One of them is called the Future Probable Database. That's everything that could possibly happen and the probability that it might happen just a database. <clears throat> now, how do they get that database? That database is computed. It starts with what is the present. It takes its information that it knows about all the players from all their history of playing through all their lifetimes and where they are. 
it takes its understanding of the game setting, you know, the weather, the earthquakes, all the things that are in the virtual reality. And then it takes a guess at what's <coughs> likely to happen next. Okay? It looks at all the things that could possibly happen, all the choices that could be made. Now that's a lot, but it only has to really look at significant choices. It doesn't really care whether I scratch my head with my right hand or scratch my head with my left hand. That's not a big changer of things. So those sorts of things can be ignored unless there's some probability that they might actually be significant to someone. So it doesn't have to keep every possibility, but it keeps all the significant possibilities. <clears throat> now, the next step is to say, well, let's assume that of all the possible things that could happen next, we've gotten all of them. And now, if that happened next, what would be the next set of things that could possibly happen next? If we're going out of delta t at a time, well, the delta t is only 10 to the minus 44 seconds, so it's not really a big leap into the future. It's pretty easy to tell what's going to happen 10 to the minus 44 seconds next. So <clears throat> you can keep working this out, working this out, until you take it as far as you like. <clears throat> Pardon my voice. Take it as far as you like. And the further out you go, the rattier the, you know, the possibilities are. The less and less distinct they are, the more they tend to fan out. So you can only go so far before it just doesn't make sense anymore. But sometimes there's things that are really probable pretty far out. Well, that's our future probable database. Okay. Now, the next delta t comes by, and free will makes a choice. <coughs> free will does something, and it doesn't have to do what was expected. It can do anything. But generally, it does at least one of the things that was the prediction, because it was everything possible that could happen and the probability that it would. So it may not pick the most probable. It may do something else. We humans are pretty good at, at uh, coming off the wall with our, you know, with our choices sometimes. <clears throat> so it then will have to make corrections. So after the next delta t, it says, oh, it wasn't quite like this. Now the probabilities have changed a little bit because it made this choice instead of that choice. That changes the probability. So we'll run a little change out that link of possibilities and so on. So that's the way the system works, future probable database. What you can do with your intent is modify those probabilities. You can make things more or less probable. <clears throat> now I have, to, I have to caution you, I guess, at this point about the fact that these things that I'm telling you about, the larger consciousness system, the individuated unit of consciousness, what incarnates here I call a free will awareness unit, and I'm talking about these databases, these are all metaphors. Okay. <clears throat> Don't start believing in these things as fixed concrete things that are there. There are no fixed concrete things that are there. These are metaphors. It's one of the neat things about this, this data. You get information, but you don't get the source of that information. You see, the information doesn't come with a tag on it that says, this is from Harry. This is from the larger consciousness system. This is out of your imagination. You just get the data. <clears throat> you have to interpret that data. You see? Okay. So we have this future probable database, part of our feedback in this reality frame. There's also a past database, because next delta t, everything we did do becomes history. And everything that we possibly could have done but didn't also becomes in the probable history database. Not the actual history, but the probable history database. So it's all the possibilities, things that we could have done, and the probability we'd do it, and all the things that we could have done but did and didn't, and the probabilities attached to those. So you see, it's all really just one database, and it just passes through the present and turns from a future database to a past database, but it's really all the same things. Once you calculate all those probabilities, it just flows through with little changes based on what we actually did do, free will choices, 
and then has to make <coughs> modifications from there on. Okay, that's the way it works. <coughs> now, remember I said that what actually manifests here is a random draw from a distribution, a probability distribution of the possibilities. Okay? Now, if you can change that probability distribution, then you change the probability of things happening. Okay? Remember we talked about that? Every, every possibility was a certain number of cards in a box that we were going to take a random draw from. The things that were highly probable had a whole lot of cards with that possibility on it, and the things that were very low probability of just a few or maybe just one, and then we put them all in there and we take a random draw and that's what happens. Well, if you can shift that probability now to where this one that had a whole lot of cards doesn't have so many anymore, and this one that had only a few has more, you see, it's still a random draw. You may, you know, it may not come out with the choice that your intention is trying to implement, but you've changed the probability that that choice will be drawn. So there's a few things that matter here. One of them is how much you're trying to change the probability. So if there's something that is very, very probable, so it's got a probability peak that's this big, big probability peak, very probable, and you may want the opposite to happen, and you're going to use your intent to try to get the opposite to happen, you may work very hard, and you may be very powerful, and you may cut it all the way down to now instead of 100,000 to 1, and now it's only 500 to 1, well, you're quite the wizard to be able to move it that far, but it's still not likely to happen. <laughs> it's still 500 to 1, you see. So even though you're powerful, you can't always have what you want because some things are more or less probable than others. <clears throat> now that also will tell you that the things that are, that are not highly probable and not highly improbable fall somewhere in the middle. Those are the things that are most flexible. Those are the things that are uncertain. So the uncertainty comes into this description. Things that are highly probable and highly improbable don't have a lot of uncertainty. If it's a million one that this will happen or a million one that it won't, there's not a lot of uncertainty there. Just a little bit. <clears throat> the uncertainty is never... Uh, one or zero. It's always somewhere in the, in the middle. Things are never absolutely must happen and things that are absolutely can never happen. Those are very few. Most everything's in between. So we can raise and lower the probabilities in this probability database so when the random draw is taken it just changes the probability a little bit. We still may or may not get it. If there's a lot of uncertainty, which means the probability is kind of somewhere in the middle, then it's easier for us to have an effect. Now things can more easily be modified by our intent. And it's cumulative. If you keep your intent focused on something, and you focus, you know, let's say you do a little meditation and you focus on intent, then you do it again, you do it again, and you do it again, and then you keep it in the back of your mind, and you keep working, that's more powerful than if you just, you know, put your intent on it once. If 10 people get together and they all intend for a particular outcome, that's more powerful than just one person. So it's cumulative. Now what might you do with this? Well, this, these databases are uh, key in many of the things that are called paranormal. Okay. Remote viewing is just gathering data out of the databases. And remote viewers found that they can remote view the future as well as remote view the past. They're just getting data out of a database. They don't know that, but that's all they're doing. You're getting data out of a database. When the lady looks at all the, the, the uh, tea particles, when they throw the tea in and they read the tea leaves, it's just getting information out of the database. It's not that the tea leaves are magic or that she's magic. When she looks at those tea leaves, she kind of lets her mind open up to the information, and when she does, she gets the download because she's learned how to do that. <clears throat> so when you um, heal someone with your mind, 
you're changing the probability of them having health, good health, or having a, an illness. You're just changing the probability. The second thing that's important, other than how much you have to change it, and how much uncertainty there is, is how much power, how much you bring to the process. There are weak intents and there are strong intents. Intents that are primarily intellectual are very weak intents. Intents that come out of the being level, you might say from the heart, those kind of intents are much stronger intents. They carry more weight. Intents that are self-serving and driven by ego and fear generally are much weaker intents. Why? Because they come out of a higher entropy process. High entropy makes them weak. It's scattered. It's not, you know, it's not um, focused. It isn't, um, it isn't as powerful in general. Which takes us to another subject, and that is those people who evolve or de-evolve to the negative side you can do that. You can learn to modify reality with your intent just through practice, just through drill, you know, through, um, well, learning to concentrate, learning to uh, get in good meditation states. It doesn't have to be for good purposes. It can be for bad purposes. And just through the force of will, you can get some good at it. But you're limited. You will never get but so good at it. You'll always be kind of mediocre. Whereas if you progress on the positive side, there's really no limit as to how far you can progress. That's because the negative side carries the seeds of its own destruction. The fear, fear is, is a destructive, dysfunctional thing. And though you can gain some power temporarily, eventually that power is self-destructive. So the negative side is very limited. On the other hand, if you have a being who has power and it's working on the negative side, they can seem like a very big fish if they're in a small pond. They can seem very powerful if all the people don't really know much of anything. But compared to somebody who's a, a bigger fish in the positive pond, they're really a pretty small fish. So there is a negative side to which you can evolve with power control and force. It just doesn't go far. Um, but consciousness is consciousness. You can uh, use your intent to remove a headache or to cause one. You see, it's not a problem. If you use it to cause them, eventually you'll pay the price for that sort of behavior because you are de-evolving. When you de-evolve your next time that you are here to grow up, you start further back than where you started before. You're going backwards in your evolution. You see, higher entropy, more randomness, more things going in scattered directions. Eventually you can see you self-destruct if you continue on that path for very long. All right, so what can we do with this? We can heal, we can remote view from a database, We can see auras. Auras is just data from the database. That's just getting data. And you can have an aura about health. You can have one about spiritual growth. You can have one about uh, emotions. You know, and you can call this like the health body and the you know, emotional body or the spiritual body or whatever, but they're not anything to do with bodies really. You're just getting data out of a database. One of the nifty things about this database is that you can specify what the output format is. There's some default outputs if you don't specify, but you get to specify what the format is. So if, you're, if you don't specify what you get for saying an aura, if you're looking at say a health body or an emotional body, you will get it in color pictures with different colors representing different kinds of feelings or emotions or the state of your 
your evolution or health or whatever. But if you want to specify something else, let's say you'd like it to be graphical, you can say, all right, give me a graph. And I want the graph uh, to be health on this axis. Well, for you, it's backwards. Health on this axis, time on that axis, and I'd like to see how, this how a person's health is likely to change over time. And you'll get a graph. If you want pie charts, you get pie charts. If you want statistics along with it, like uh, variance and uh, standard deviation and all of that, you can get that too. Or you can get pictures. You can get different kinds of colors. So they're all, any format you want is there. Okay. Now, one of the things that consciousness does is that it, it um, is netted. I told you that. We're all communicating all the time. So because of that, there is a kind of a group consciousness going on at a lower level among groups. How do you get to be in a group? You identify with it. If you identify yourself as an employee of Tata or General Motors or IBM, that puts you now in a culture. And the culture at Tata and the culture at IBM are different. The culture at General Motors is different yet. And there's cultures at the national level. There's cultures you know, at the, the, the uh, um, hum, human level. These were called archetypes by Carl Jung. Carl Jung called these things, this, this collective consciousness was an archetype. And he found archetypes at all various kinds of levels. They're cultural. Uh, I mean, if you're, if you're a policeman, being a policeman puts you into a particular culture. The culture puts you into a particular mindset. The mindset puts you into a particular way of interpreting reality, which puts you into a different reality than other people. Okay. So now we're going to get data, and we're going to have to interpret that data. How we interpret that data depends on our history, our mindset, what we come there with. Okay. All of the experiences that we've had here, all of our history, that's what we have to interpret the data in those terms because this, this, we're doing it from here, from this avatar. Consciousness is doing it, but the consciousness is limited okay, by what the avatar can support. That's the way it is. My elf in World of Warcraft, I can't say, elf, flap your arms and fly away because elf can't do that. R rule set doesn't support it. You say the, the rule set creates constraints for the consciousness. That's the whole point of it. Makes the consciousness have to work with in those rules with what they've got. Therefore, you have strategies and context and all that. Okay, so we make our own reality out of the, out of the data that we get. We get data that we have very little experience with we have a hard time interpreting it. If we get data and we let our intellect jump in front of that data, what I mean by that is we start processing it right away. We get some data. And the first thing when the data comes in is, is that real? Did I just make that up? Uh, where'd that come from? Could that be right? Could that be wrong? That just makes the whole thing not work anymore. So the, the biggest problem people have is getting in their own way with their intellect. You need to tell that intellect just to sit down, be quiet. You're going to operate from the being level, not from the intellectual level. You're going to open yourself. And if you have an intent for particular information, then that information, if it's particularly in the service of your growth rather than the service of your ego, then you'll get that information. The hard part is letting that intellect go and not to comment on it. The lady that reads the tea leaves, she's learned how to let that go just for the moment that it takes for her to get the data that she tells you. Okay. It's, a, it's a, a skill that one can learn. It's not that hard. Okay. Remote viewing is the same way. When you remote view, you have an intent to see what's happening at a particular place future, past, 
but your intent now must be precise. This is another key, it must be precise. This is an information system. You are querying an information system with an intent. If your query is broad and sloppy, you'll get a lot of broad and sloppy junk back, just like Google. Right? So you go into Google and you say, Google, love. You know, when you tell it to go, you get six million things back, five million of which you really don't want to see. And it's hard to get the stuff you do want to see. <coughs> you need a precise intent, very precise. One of the, other, one of the, the second big problem in, in healing anyway is that your intents are not precise. Often when I, when I do workshops and uh, we actually do healing and remote viewing, you know, we do those exercises. Um, I'll have people who will tell me later that, let's say I had four remote viewing uh, exercises and they'll say I got every one of them but I got them in the wrong order. That happens every time. Last time we did this was just in Australia. That happened then, it happens almost every time. What that is, is just a sloppy intent. Their intent wasn't specific enough to get that specific target. They had an intent that was something like, I want to know what that remote viewing object was. Well, I've got four remote viewing objects. Which one were you talking about? You see, that's not a specific intent. So you make it a random one. And the next one, the intent was, there's part of that intent, that these intents don't have to be spoken or literal. They're, they're, they have to also to do with you at the being level. So some people have things attached to their intents and they don't even know that they're there. When they say that, I want to, you know, I want to see this. Well, what's this? You see, this has some meaning to them, but if it's not clear, then what they get back won't be clear. So your intents need to be real focused. But that I want to see this has within it hidden probably an intent this between the, the ones that uh, haven't been shown yet. <coughs> you know, this wouldn't claim be the ones that have already been shown and the target's already been revealed. So anyway, that kind of thing happens. So intents need to be specific. You need to hold them. To heal, you need a whole string of intents. You get to pick, let's say you want to diagnose somebody. A typical way of that is saying, all right, you have an intention to see the health information of someone. You can intend that there is like a gingerbread cookie humanoid outline, and you can intend, and that represents Susie Q, your target. Okay? Now, there may be a thousand Susie Qs, so it needs to be the Susie Q that is, you know, the target. Your targets just don't come to you randomly. You know, you know somebody that gave you Susie Q's name and it's that target. As long as there is an address that takes you to that particular Susie Q because it's the one that had the problem that my friend handed to me, that's a good enough address. There's only one that fits that description. Okay? You don't need a lock of Susie Q's hair. You don't need a picture. You don't need anything else. You just need a clear intent. So then you'd have your intent that within this humanoid outline, those things in Suzuki's health that are healthy shall be bright white. And those things in Suzuki's health data that are unhealthy will be dark. And uh, the more unhealthy it is, the darker it is. Well, if that's your definition of the output format you want, okay, so you will. You'll see this humanoid outline, it'll be light and there'll be a dark spot you know, in another dark spot, and you'll say, oh, okay, that's right about here, that must be a heart, and that's this one, you know, and you can start doing diagnosis. Well, then you'll find out that you get left and right wrong, because with your intent, you didn't specify whether you're looking from the front or looking from the back, so your left and rights will be backwards. What you thought was here is here. You forgot that, and then you'll do it again, and you'll get something else wrong because you forgot to look sideways to see whether it's front or back. So then you learn to take your gingerbread cookie and turn it around if you want that picture to work from you. You don't have to. You want them rather than picture, you want a list, you can get a list. 
would you like the list with names, with red, red arrows, you know, pointing to a body someplace? You can get that. You can get any kind of picture you want. Okay, so you get to do the output. Sometimes graphs are really handy. But most people don't know they can specify the output. Most healers don't know that. They learn a particular output format, and that's what they use. And they think uh, that that's the only way to do it. But you can have any output you want. It's a database. You're querying it. As long as you're specific, you'll get that data back. It's the same with the remote view. You have to be specific about what you're remote viewing. With a remote view, and with the healing too, the database is very fast. So you get your data back almost instantly. Matter of fact, it's so fast, most people miss it. They're not even ready for it yet. Because they're expecting it's like, our computers are expecting it's like they're talking to somebody and they have to wait for a reply. But they ask it and there it is, instant, just in a microsecond after the last of the intent went out, the answer's back. And they're not prepared for it, so they miss it altogether. After then they say, well, what was it? I didn't get anything. Well, they already got it and it went by. But you can ask again. Like any query system, you need to focus your queries what I mean by that is ask a query, and if it doesn't give you what you want, modify it. Add a qualifier, you know, in Google. Put quotes around it, and then you'll only get, you know, what those words, words are together. You know, you can start modifying your quote. And as long as you know what your intent is, you can put quotes around it, and it'll work just like Google. If that's your intent, that that's what quotes mean, you see? So... That's a little bit about modifying, you know, the future, future probability. Healing is an easy thing to do. So is remote viewing. Any of you in here can learn how to heal and probably be at the 60, 70, 75% level of success in three months worth of practice. It's not hard. It's an easy thing to do. And, I, and the same with remote viewing. And I, I tell people that because particularly left brain people need some logical process. They need experience that they can see it for themselves. They can experience it for themselves. You see, if you don't experience it for yourself, you're stuck with actually three possibilities. One, somebody tells you about it, right? Then three possibilities. One, you believe it, you disbelieve it, both of those are almost the same. Neither one's useful. Whether you believe it or disbelieve it is irrelevant. Or you can, you can guess at about how much credibility it has and say, well, I'll give it 30% that that's true and 70% that it's false. And then just hold it on the side and realize that you don't know enough information to really do any better than that. And the last thing, of course, is you can go find out. You can go have the experience and find out. If it's not your experience, it's not your truth. Believing it and disbelieving it are both irrelevant. Now, when I say irrelevant, I mean they won't help you grow a bit. If you just believe it, it's not yours. It's not going to help you go anywhere. Okay. And that's true about everything I tell you as well. Don't believe a word of what I say. Don't disbelieve a word of what I say. Take it in as a possibility and hold it against your own knowledge and your own background, against how you would you know, evaluate that, and keep it as a possibility with the idea that you can collect more data later. You can experiment, you can see, but then actually make the effort to collect that data if you can. And sometimes remote viewing and healing is one way you can collect data on how the larger conscious system works, which is why I talk about it. But now having said that, I'll also tell you that paranormal things are not necessary to do. They don't make you evolve. It's just something you can do because your consciousness. It is not necessary. Becoming love does not require you to ever do anything paranormal. In fact, doing things paranormal can get in your way if your ego gets wrapped up around them. 
then it becomes a problem. Then it can keep you from growing up. Also, using your intent to modify future probability and to gather data from the databases, people who start to get good at that, they start using it a lot, they find out it creates problems for themselves. And the reason is that they're now interfering with their own game. In other words, you're here because stuff happens and you get to deal with it. If the stuff that happens is the stuff that you're manipulating to happen with your intent, now you are, you are prohibiting yourself from getting the things you need to deal with, to learn, to grow up. So you can, you can misuse it in the sense that it gets in your way of growing up. You don't want to manipulate things. You want things just to happen and you deal with them. Whether that's happy or whether that's harsh, that's the way it is. You should deal with those. And what you'll find is the people who have the most power and practice at modifying future probability use it the least because they've learned that there's really no point. They just live their life, they take what happens, and they deal with it, and that's the way it is. They don't, you know, fix themselves every time, you know, they get hurt or they have a medical problem or they want something to happen or they need a parking place. You know, you can do all sorts of things with it. You know, you drive into a busy city and you want a parking place, start before you even leave with an intent. When I get there, somebody's going to back out right in front of me when I get there and I'll be able to pull into it. Hold that image. <laughs> Put intent to it from the being level, and you will raise the probability of that happening. And since there's so many cars coming and going all the time, then the probability, you know, there's a fair amount of uncertainty. Well, within that uncertainty, you can make a difference. Those things can happen. But if you start manipulating everything like that, you will get in your way. So <coughs> the idea is use this information to prove to yourself that the larger consciousness system is real, that modifying future intent with your, I mean, future probability with your intent is real, that you can heal, that you can connect with other people, mind to mind, telepathic communications are available, empathy is, a <coughs> is available. Yes, there's somebody who's sitting on a stool in a Restaurant having a sandwich, yes, you can taste that sandwich if you want. You can share that feeling. You can feel that pain or that joy. You can connect. All those things are available to you. You can communicate with people. And as you communicate with people, they can be people in bodies here like you, or they can be people deceased, or they can be people that have never had a body here. You can communicate. <coughs> The purpose for all of this is for you to gain experience in getting rid of the noise in your mind because you're not very good at it if your, noise, your mind is noisy. People sometimes call that monkey mind where your mind is always jabbering about things and jumping from thing to thing. It'll help you control that. Well, when you control that, you also have to control some of your fears, your expectations, and your ego because that's where your monkey mind comes from. So those are good exercises, okay? And you will then have the experiences that will convince you that this is real, not just a figment of your imagination, and therefore it deserves your attention and your focus because you really are here to grow up, and the system does work like this. <coughs> so use it for that. Don't abuse it to the point that you want to get in other people's heads, you want to put information in their minds, you know. You tell your boss, give, you know, give Tom a raise. Tom's the one that deserves the raise, you know, sort of like the uh, <coughs> Obi-Wan, right? Says, uh, you know, there's nobody here that you're interested in. That does work. You can connect with people. But if you connect with people like that, yes, they will hear you in their intuition. Whether they hear you in their intellect or not, Maybe, maybe not. But in their, their intuition, they will get the message. <clears throat> and if you abuse that, they will know that too, eventually. And you will have shot yourself in the foot as far as that relationship goes. If you do that because you're trying to help and it's about them, 
right? So you want to talk to your teenager because it's hard to sit down and talk to your teenager face to face because when you do, emotions start to flare up because, you know, that's the way teenagers are, right? They're living out of their gonads most of the time and they have a lot of emotional stuff that flares. So it's hard to get a face to face talk. But if you really want to have a heart to heart, you can do that with your intent, with your mind, and they will get it. But if what you do is try to convince them to do what you want them to do, that's not a good idea. That's manipulation. If what you tell them is stuff that's really about them, tell them that you love them. Tell them that you're, they're really neat people. Tell them, you know, possibilities. I know you want to do this sort of thing. You know, I know you want to get a tattoo, you know, uh, you know, around your belly button or something, and you don't think that's a good idea. So you'd like to just say, I prohibit you from doing that. But that will push them toward doing it better than anything else. And as soon as they get out of your control, you know, that'll be the first thing they'll run out and do. So <clears throat> better yet to say, here are the advantages and the disadvantages. Amongst your peers, it'll probably make you more cool and that will have some advantage to you. 10 years from now, it might make you less cool because you'll have a whole different set of peers and they've all grown up and be a lot more mature than they are today and there's no way to erase it. And you may just have this conversation, not telling them not to, not trying to talk them into anything, just giving them options, maybe four or five options, some of the good things that might happen, some of the bad things that might happen. This might make you feel better, feel more whatever, you know, more in, better connected with your peers or whatever. You can give that positive thing, but here's the upsides, here's the downsides. You know, your decision is your decision. Don't try to manipulate their free will. Always let their free will be theirs if they're old enough, right? So you can have those heart-to-heart -heart talks. Sometimes people have had strained relationships with a parent and they can't really talk about that face to face. Maybe the parents even deceased. Doesn't matter. You can still have that conversation. Okay. So these are useful things that you can do with your intent and with your mind and they do work. You can make peace with your parents if they raised you to have certain fears and problems and things that you got from that relationship. You sit down and make peace, but make it in terms of love, make it in terms of positive, not in terms of manipulation, not in terms of I'm right, you're wrong. All of that will create more trouble than it will solve. So I offer you these paranormal things to do so that your left brain will understand the nature of reality from your personal experience so it will be your truth, not just something that you hear me talk about. Okay. So that's mostly the, the value of it. Easy to do. If you want to know more of the details of how to do it, techniques and, and things, look on YouTube at some of my workshops. And typically on a Saturday, I stand up and do theory. And on Sunday, we just do experiential and practice. And besides, you'll get a bunch of healing and remote viewing targets there too that'll be sorted out for you. So. If you listen to some of those, you'll get the idea of techniques and things you can do. But these techniques are all just metaphorical. They're just metaphorical. They're not fundamental. Make up your own techniques. You don't have to use somebody else's. You don't have to have a white gingerbread cookie with, you know, with black spots. It can be something totally different. You don't have to heal with a beam of light. There is no light. Light's just a metaphor, you see? There is no light. You don't have to do any of those things. You don't have to reach in and pull out the black spots with your hands. You don't have to cut it out with tools. All of those are metaphors to help you focus your intent on what it is you're doing. So there is no light. You know, there is no gingerbread cookie. There really is no, no health body. It's just information and probability. You see? Now here's one that'll probably run a little afoul of most of your cultural beliefs, but the same is true of things like chakras. Chakras are not fundamental. 
They're a way of looking. They're an output format. They're tools. Are they useful? Sure. So is the gingerbread cookie and the, you know, and using the light beam to get rid of black spots. They're tools. But the tools are not fundamental. We have to look at the data and produce metaphors about the data so that we can discuss it, so that we make sense of it. We have to be able to put it into language. You see, we think in our language. So we have all this information and we have to put that into some kind of form that we can then process with our language. Our language was meant to represent this physical world. Things like bodies, trees and rocks and rivers and moons and suns and that sort of thing. So we put it into those sorts of terms. So the information there is all correct. That you slice and dice and, and put that information in, a, in the form of seven chakras, that's a tool. A good tool, but it's a tool. You could have made it five chakras or ten chakras and divided up the, the things differently or whatever, and it still worked just the same. There's nothing fundamental about that. You know, the, the Zen Buddhists don't see chakras, and the shaman, you know, in the uh, indigenous uh, you know, Americas, they don't see chakras either, but they talk about a lot of the same things. It's just another way of looking at the data. And if you want to, to, uh, to form your intents based on those sorts of things, like you intend to exercise a certain chakra, well, then that means something within the context of what chakra means and so on, and that's your intent. But any other intent would work as well. So the tools are not sacred. And unfortunately, various groups have their own tool sets. And then people fight over tool sets. My tool set's better. Than your my tool set's right. Your tool set's wrong. You know, to Christians, the cross is one of their tools, right? They can chase demons away with it. It's a tool. It's just a tool. There's nothing magical about it. It's a, it's a mindset. It helps focus an intent on a particular outcome. Okay, so you don't need to use other people's tools. In fact, you will be more effective if you use your own tools than if you use somebody else's. You have to have your own experience. You can't have somebody else's experience. Those tools that suit you, you'll be more effective with them. So instead of a, a beam of light that burns away black things, you can have a little wand and you can sprinkle fairy dust off the end of your wand on those black things and make them disappear. Yeah, that may be a tool that suits you. Wands and fairy dust, you see. It works just as well. It's just a tool to focus your intent. Intent is what changes things. Okay, so that's kind of the databases and uh, how we can uh, use them, why we should use them, what we shouldn't do with them. If your intent is focused on you growing up and becoming love, you'll find that the system will help you. That larger consciousness system will help you out. Your intent could just be, I'd like to understand how I can better evolve the quality of my consciousness. I'd like to understand Stan, what would, should my next step be? You will have that answered. It may not be in words. It may just be in things that happen. Signs, as they say, whatever. But you'll get that answer. So be careful what you ask for. Sometimes people are a little brash when they ask. All right, larger conscious system, I'm here, sock it to me. You know, I want to learn. I want to see everything. And, Larger kinds of system socks it to them and then they're very sad. They're not ready for it. Your intent will express the degree of your readiness. When you are ready, the next step will follow. Before you are ready, the next step will be very hard to attain. So make yourself ready and progress will just fall in front of your feet. So the most important thing you can do is become love. If you need to have verification of all of this, then learn how to do some paranormal things like healing. When you do heal, though, and if you do communicate with people, dead or alive or never been here, 
remember there's responsibility with that. If you're modifying in probable future, make sure you're not overrunning somebody else's free will. People often have illness for a purpose. That illness isn't always there because it's an awful thing that happened to them. It may be awful from this perspective, from the little picture perspective. From a big picture perspective, it may be just what they need to grow up. And you think, yeah, okay, they grow up, but it'll kill them. Is it worth it? Of course it's worth it. That's what you're here to do is grow up. You see? And it's just another lifetime. If you grow up because of your end game, because of you know, the way you die or the things you learn in the dying process, well, then you get to start that much further ahead next time. If you live a long life but don't learn much, you get to start to whatever it is you earned, you see? So that's kind of the sense of karma. Karma is basically there's no free pass. You have to grow up on your own. And if you don't grow up, well, you get to try again. And if you still don't grow up, you get to try again. There's no punishment for not growing up. Your punishment is that you don't evolve and you have to try again. So that's the kind of the foundation of, of karma. It's uh, you're, you're kind of failing in the gameplay here. You're not getting it. So every time you fail, every time you de-evolve, you start at a little lower place on the evolutionary chain. Now you have to work yourself out of the hole you just put yourself in that last time because of your bad choices. That's your karma. You see, but it's, it's not a judgment and it's not a punishment. It's just you're trying to reduce your entropy and if you increase it instead, well, then you've got even more work to do. You're behind. So that's the origins of that. So I'm trying to get through a lot of things here before we get to the end. Um, I know I'm generating lots of questions, so I need to get on with it so that you have time to ask them. The last thing I want to to mention is an event, things that are going to happen in the near decade or two future and what these have to do with science and spirituality since that's the topic here today. I want to now at the end wrap up the science and the technology. Scientists have over the past decade changed their tune immensely about this idea of us being in a virtual reality. When I first published my books in 2003, myself and maybe two or three other scientists thought virtual reality was a good idea. Everybody else in the scientific community thought it was insane. Didn't make any sense. Today, physicists in every major university on this planet think virtual reality is the truth. It's the way it is. I see papers coming across my desk all the time about somebody else who's done an experiment of this and something of that, and the only answer is that this is a virtual reality. Scientists now in groups, top-end scientists, you know, the MITs, the, the CERN, the, the, the top guys at the top institutions get together, have conferences about virtual reality. So you see it's a real thing. They're coming to that conclusion not because they like it, they intensely dislike it. They're coming to that conclusion because their experiments are dragging them there, kicking and screaming all the way. That's what the experiments say. This double slit experiment I showed you was in the 1920s, almost 100 years ago. And what did scientists do? They said, well, that's weird science. Guess nobody will ever solve that. Let's go on to other things because it undermined their belief, which was in materialism. Well, what's happening now is that as this builds to a crescendo, eventually, within the next decade or two, scientists will say, you know, yea, verily, this is a virtual reality. We've decided. It's not something we're just discussing anymore. It's the only thing that fits the data. When they say that, they're going to start a chain reaction, kind of dominoes falling. One falls and knocks over the next, which knocks over the next. 
This chain reaction is going to give humanity an opportunity to take a big step forward spiritually that they've never had before. This is the first chance humanity has had this opportunity. See, we've had what I call bubbles of enlightenment in the margins of humanity forever, right? I mean, how old is Hinduism? How old is Buddhism? Not as old as Hinduism since Hinduism created Buddhism or came out of it, but still. There's been enlightenment, understanding, all the things that I've told you about the way reality works. You can find in this ancient literature, but you find it as poetry. You have to interpret it. You have to understand it, and people disagree with their interpretations, but it's there, you see. And these bubbles of enlightenment have always been there. Why? In all ages, not just in the ancient past, but they're there now. They're all over this globe in all sorts. It's the, you know, it's the, the bush people in, in uh, you know, Australia, the Maori in New Zealand, the, the American uh, indigenous people in North America and South America. They all understood much of this. Few of them got it all, but they got a lot of it. The reason is that they're consciousness, not bodies. As consciousness, it's all available to them. All they have to do is get out of the way and pay attention. And some of them do. There's always somebody who does that, gets out of the way and pays attention. And they tell other people and it kind of rings a bell and it rings true, so it tends to grow, but it stays localized. Well, what's different now? What'll change this now? There's two things. One of them is the internet. Now this world is shrinking. It's getting smaller and smaller. Used to be things that happened 5,000 miles away, it's like they didn't happen at all. They were like imaginary things that somebody told you a story about. Now you get to see it up close and personal within hours of it happening. That's different. That's going to have a big impact. It's just beginning to have that impact. Well, the internet is shrinking us. You only used to know what happened like that up close and personal if it was within like 20 miles of where you lived. See, now it's everywhere. When we get shrunken down to the size of a small village or a family, now we're to a point where we can interact with love and with caring and with respect for each other. That will help a lot. So the internet now can take all these little bubbles of enlightenment and they can all see each other. And they can all say, oh, you know, my ideas are a little different, but fundamentally they're all pretty much the same. Instead of fighting with each other, we need to kind of get together. There's lots of us. If you add up all the people on this planet who have some spiritual understanding, there's a lot of us, a lot more than you would think. A study on, on how many people had experienced a paranormal event, at least in the U.S., was like 75%. You see, there's a lot of us who have had connections with the larger consciousness system. We don't necessarily understand it or put it in context, but there's a big reservoir there, but it's all scattered. It's all out in the margins and little pools and people who've had these experiences, they don't tell anybody because they think people think they're crazy. They keep it quiet. But with an internet, they'll find out that a lot of other people are having that too. They'll start talking about it. So the internet is one big difference that we have. The second big difference is that the high priests of our culture, the physicists, are in the next decade or two going to say, this is a virtual reality. When they say that, that means that there is some other reality, non-physical, that is the superset that we are derived from it. There is this non-physical superset that is our cause, you see. That is a big step for this, the middle in this big um, uh, materialist worldview. That's going to be a shock because it's coming straight from the high priests. It's enormous, you see. The high priests have told us there's this non-physical superset from which we are derived. That sounds downright religious, doesn't it? The high priests won't say that unless they have to. That's the, that frightens them to death. But they won't be able to not say that because that's what their experiments are saying.
that will come out. And when it does, there's a few things that can happen. When they say that, the first thing that, uh, what, uh, you know, two or three billion people will say the next day is, well, who's the programmer? Where's the computer, right? That'll be, you know, a couple of billion people will think that the very next day. Where's the computer? Who's the programmer? And it would be unfortunate if after that, there became this big fight among established religions for whose God was the best programmer. That would be very unfortunate. No, my God's the best programmer. See? So hopefully we won't go there. Hopefully we won't have that situation. We'll have a, an understanding that it wasn't programmed. It evolved. It just evolved. It didn't evolve supernaturally. It evolved naturally. It's just a natural system trying to survive like all other natural systems, and it does that by lowering entropy, by breaking itself into pieces, by creating this virtual reality. That's how it survives. It's not a done deal. It's not perfect. It's still in the process, and we're part of that process. If we have that bigger picture, then maybe we can avoid the, my God's the programmer. And maybe we can kind of all grow up together within a couple of decades. Wouldn't that be amazing? But there's this opportunity. The high priests are going to tell us that there's a, a non-physical superset. And we're going to be close enough together that that news will spread like wildfire. Billions of people will hear it within a month. It'll be discussed, it'll be, everybody will be talking about it, you know, all the talking heads will be yammering about it, and it'll just build up. And the idea that there is a spiritual dimension to us will become obvious to everybody, not just to those in the margins. And people are going to know, well, what's this mean to me? Okay, so you know, who am I? Why am I here? How do I fit into this big non-physical thing? You know, what is it? Is it God? Well, if you want to call the larger conscious system God, I don't have any problem with that. A lot of people would do that. There's no dogma involved. There's no creeds. There's nothing you have to believe. In fact, you're supposed to not believe anything. You're supposed to stay skeptical about everything. So that's a possibility we have. And the question is, how are we going to meet that? When that day comes, are we going to be wise enough to take that impetus and move it toward growth, or are we gonna be foolish enough to start a big argument and spend the next 50 years you know, arguing and fighting with each other over ownership of the programmer? Well, that's a question. We don't know that yet. But I do know that probably within a couple of decades, we're gonna have the opportunity to find out. So that's one of the reasons I'm making this cultural connection tour, because that's news that I'd like to share as widely as possible. The more people who understand the nature of reality and what's coming and prepared for it and talk about it, then the higher the probability is that when that happens, we will take a giant leap forward in humanity and understanding. Because after you realize that there's this non-physical entity, entity system that is our superset, the second thing you understand is that it's consciousness. We're consciousness because remember, we start with the physicist saying it is a virtual reality, then we're the players, we're consciousness. That comes out. The next thing is that information systems, you know, that it's an information system. That's pretty obvious. Information, the physicists will tell us that too. Information systems evolve by lowering entropy. I mean, that's a known fact of physics. That's not a, you know, that's not a leap. Well, if that's the case, and it's evolving by lowering its entropy, it's not that big a jump to realize that caring, love, cooperation are low entropy ways of interacting, and greed, <coughs> you know, self-centeredness, lack of trust, it's all about me, that is high entropy way. So it's not gonna be that hard to get then to that last domino that says love is the answer. That's what we're here for. And if we can get to that in a massive way, then I think that uh, we might see in a few decades a giant step forward. 
in the human race to a higher level of you know, consciousness quality, spirituality. And that's really an important message to share. Because if we don't understand, we're going to have a higher probability of ending up in this big struggle over it for the next two decades after that. Or even worse, you know. Hopefully we wouldn't devolve into religious wars, but uh, we've done it before. We've shown the capacity to think that way. Tom, thank you for the, your talk. Um, uh, what I wanted to uh, ask was that <coughs> the binary beats and, uh, you know, hemisync, mm -hmm. uh, the work over there, and how can that, uh, which, because there's such a genre of it, how does that work in terms of helping us to go towards love? And are there any particular ones that you would recommend that can help in this journey? Okay, yes. Um, Hemisync, I don't know if all of you know what that means. That's a patented name of the Monroe Institute. Uh, basically, the, the active ingredient there is a binaural beat. Binaural beats are a, a technology that puts a pure tone of a certain frequency in this ear, a tone with a little different frequency in this ear. The two tones go down the auditory nerve. They get to the corpus callosum, which is that membrane between the hemispheres, and they mix there. Not in the air, but they mix at the corpus callosum. <clears throat> and for some quirk of biology, that actually then will drive your EEG output, your brain waves, toward that frequency. So what we do is we put in, say, 100 hertz tone here, 104 hertz tone here, that'll produce a 4 hertz beat at your corpus callosum. That will drive your EEG into a theta state because 4 hertz is a theta state. A theta state is more relaxed, <coughs> more relaxed than an alpha. An alpha is feeling chilled, right? Ah, it's nice, everything's calm and cool, that's alpha. Beta is yum, 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 like this. No? Yes. Yes, yes. okay. Oh, okay. And uh, theta is below alpha and above delta. Delta is you're out cold. You're unconscious. So theta is that state that transitions from very relaxed into unconscious. That's a very productive state. Meditators, when they're in their meditation states that are very productive, produce a lot of theta in their EEGs. All the time, your brains are producing electromagnetic energy. It's in all sorts of spectrums. You get some that are very high and some that are low. You maybe even have a little delta. You have all sorts of stuff in there. But then when you run these binaural beats, all of that scattered energy kind of all moves toward theta. So then now your theta peak is a big peak, and the rest of that's still there, but it's smaller now. More of that energy went into the theta. So that's what's, that's what's happening. It drives you into that particular state. We've had people, monks, I think they were Buddhist monks, who had decades of practice meditating, uh, came through uh, Monroe Labs while I was working there, and we let them listen to some binaural beats. And their comment was, it took me 20 years to get to this point. So it will help you get to a good, solid meditation state. <clears throat> it's got its good points and its bad points. Its good points are it'll not only get you to that meditation state, it'll hold you there. You won't drift around. You won't come and go. A lot of people, if they meditate without it, they'll be in a good meditation state for 15, 20 seconds, maybe a minute, they're off doing something else, and they just drift around and they're not steady in the state. That's what those 20 years of practice buys for you, is the ability <laughs> to get there and stay there <coughs> and the binaural beats will do that. The downside is the same thing, that it'll put you there and keep you there. As it turns out, when you want to do more with your altered state than just a deep meditation, your EEG will spread out some in different places, in different ways, and that binaural beat will lock you in. So it's like training wheels. You know, with a bicycle for your children, you get little training wheels that come off the back, keep them from falling over. Training wheels are really a good thing for young children. 
keeps them from having a bad experience on the bike. They don't fall off of it. But they'll never be good bike riders if they don't take the training wheels off. You're not gonna, you don't see any Olympic bike riders out there with training wheels on the back because that really makes it hard to be a good cyclist, you see. So <clears throat> binaural beats are the same thing. Use the binaural beats. If your meditation is not real solid, it will help it be solid. You don't have to do anything with them. You don't have to focus on them. You don't have to do anything. Just let them be there. It works by putting those sounds in and getting your corpus callosum oscillating at the different frequency. So you just let it be. <coughs> the more you fiddle with things with your intellect, the less success that you'll have. So just let it be there, relax, and then go on with your meditation. So that's, that's about the binaural beats. After a while, take off the earphones. Now you have to do it with headphones because it's pure tones. You can't just do it with speakers. Headphones. <coughs> After a while, take off the headphones. At first you'll feel like, oh, it's not the same. I can't do it. Work at it for a while. Try it without headphones for a month. You see, it'll get better and it'll get better. Then go back and use your binaural beats again and, and then try it again in a few months without the headphones. Keep working on it. Eventually, you should be able to get to that state, hold that state, be in it as long as you wish without any binaural beats. At that point, you will be freer to explore the larger consciousness system. You can explore it with the binaural beats. It's not that you can't. You can. It's just a constraint, like the training wheels. It gets you there, but keeps you there. So a good technology for those who aren't good meditators but not a substitute for learning how to become a good meditator. You really need to learn that as well. It takes time. Now, when it comes to meditation, you want a robust meditation. The binaural beats will get you started, but eventually you have to learn to meditate in all sorts of conditions. That will build a robustness into your meditation. If you meditate lying down, start meditating sitting up. Or if you meditate sitting up, lie down. Once you can do it and sit up and lying down, meditate standing on one foot. Meditate walking. Meditate then walking outside, you know, through the park. Don't run into anybody. Don't step in any holes. You still have to have part of you focused on what's going on. But learn how to meditate on a bus full of school children. Learn how to meditate in all sorts of situations. When you do that, your first attempt will be this doesn't work. I can't do it. You've always meditated lying down. Now you sit up in a chair, it just doesn't work. It doesn't feel right, it doesn't feel the same, and you'll be frustrated with it. Just keep working at it. You'll find, okay, you'll adjust, it'll work, and then eventually lie down again. And then that'll seem a little odd, and then sit up again until it doesn't matter. You see, and then pace while you're doing, then stand on one foot, then go on a bus, do all kinds of things so that you can meditate. Put your, your mind in a state where you're not attached to anything. Doesn't mean you don't hear it. Doesn't mean you don't, you know, that you'll step in that hole or run into somebody. You still can be aware, but now you're parallel processing. You have one process that's aware of where your feet are going and who's in front of you, and another process that's totally detached from this reality. It's parallel processing. You can also do that, on a, like I say, on a school bus. Harder, takes more practice, but you can. The reason for that is eventually you want to get to the point where you don't have to do anything to meditate. Meditation is not something you do, it's something you are. You're constantly connected to multiple reality frames. Somebody comes up and says, um, you know, my Aunt Susie just got a report of, you know, something in her stomach and you know, they want you to help out or something. Well, while they're talking to you, you can bring up the data from Aunt Susie. You can see basically what's wrong. You can get a graph on Aunt Susie's, uh, you know, health versus time. And you can start working on the problem of changing the probability. You can assess the situation. Is this part of Aunt Susie's path, this illness? Is it something she needs to have? Is it not? And you can do all of that in seconds and while you're having a conversation. You see, that makes meditation easy because you don't have to set off a block of time. It's just whenever. 
You live in that state. So that's where you want to go to. That's kind of what you're working toward. <coughs> but in the beginning, binaural beats are a really good aid and helps a lot of people. Some people um, probably it won't, will help more than others. It depends. You still have to let go. You still have to open yourself to it. If you lie there and say, this doesn't work, this isn't going to work, well, it won't. You see, your intellect's getting in the way there. If you have expectations, that'll get in the way. Just let it happen however it happens. Okay, so that's mostly my talk on meditation. <coughs> Everybody should learn to meditate. Uh, binaural beats. Oh, I, one thing I didn't say. You can go to Google and Google binaural beat, and you'll find a dozen sites that will make them for you. And of those, there'll be two or three that'll make them for free. All you need to do is find a bass frequency that you like. Guys tend to like a little lower tones. Females like a little higher tones. Uh, 32 hertz is about as low as you can go because most uh, amplifiers are very poor at amplifying <laughs> that low a frequency. And your headset has to be good quality, otherwise it'll just rattle. So keep it above 32. 64 is a real low tone. Uh, I tend to do them in powers of two, you know, the, the you know, 64, you know, 128, 512, you know, all the binary stuff that you have in your computer memory, because it's binary, it's the same thing. 512 is a good one, so that'd be 512 and 515 or 500 and, what, 8, if you want. 4 hertz is about a good place. You can fiddle with that too, you can go down to 3.8, you can go up to 4.1, whatever you like. And then you can custom make them. If you want more details, go to my, web, go to my uh, website, which will take you to my forum, and then search on binaural beats. And I did about a five-page thing there on how to make your, your own binaural beats. Or you can get them from Keith. When I do these immersives, we do immersives every so often where you spend 12 hours a day with me experiencing the larger consciousness system. It's an immersive. It kind of consumes your whole life for about five days and you, you and I will talk about what you experienced and what it means and what to do next and you know, how you're getting in your way and what you should try to change. And we just do this in an immersive state going back. And I make binaural beats for that. For all the people that are there, I, I generate binaural beats. And each time I generate different ones because I'm experimenting and seeing what works best and that sort of thing as well. And then Keith uh, has them on his site, which is MBT Events. And I think you get like 38 binaural beats. There are actually 32 binaural beats. Well, there are actually 16 different in both MP3 and WAV format. Yeah. So there's a lot of binaural beats, different frequencies, different all sorts of things, uh, different way they're done. I do little tricks in them where I run the, the, the beat frequency up and down and other sorts of things, dip down into delta for a few seconds. And so they're that. But if you get those, they should work as well as any. And uh, they're fairly inexpensive. Someone was asked, I think the second part of the question, Tom, was are any of the beats any better than the others? Yeah, some are. Um, the, the beats that work for you are kind of individual. The frequency you like is kind of individual. So like these ones that we have, they cover a whole range of bass frequencies, and some of them will be better than others. Basically, this is an experiment. You listen to them all, see which ones you like, use those for a while. After a while, try them again and you'll probably like different ones because you will have changed a little bit. So you keep experimenting. Matter of fact, the one set of beats, the very first time I put it on for people in, this, in one of these intensive, everybody hated it. They thought it was terrible. And by the second or third day we were there, everybody loved it. It was their favorite. So you never know. Just because you don't like one doesn't mean you won't like it later. So just try and make them. You can make them from these websites that are free. Just follow their directions and you can make one. You pick the bass frequency, you pick the B frequency, you pick how long it goes, you pick you know, whether it ramps in or whether it just starts that way. You get to choose all the variables. It comes out as an MP3 or a WAV file. <clears throat> you can play it on any of your devices. So experiment. All of this is just experimentation. Try it and see. See what happens. I've been working on it for now 40 some years, so you see it, uh, it takes a long time. Well, I'm a slow learner maybe, but it takes a, it takes a long time, so it doesn't, don't be in a rush.
Okay, remote viewing. Yeah. Uh, that, is a, that is getting data from the database. And we just brought up, well, everybody was out that that database is sometimes called the Akashic Records. It's just the data, yeah, it's the same, the same database, okay? The database is necessary because you have to track what the probabilities of things are. So when you take that random draw from the probabilities, you need to know what all the probabilities are of all the things that could happen, you see? So the database becomes a, a necessary logical part of the overall understanding. So anyway, that's the Akashic Records. Yes, remote viewing, we'll get to that. <clears throat> the key to remote viewing is to get out of your own way. The key to that being successful is to tell your intellect to be quiet and sit down. Also, the key is to get the first thing that comes into your mind, the first image. Get that, and that's more likely to be the right answer than anything you get after that. So wait for that very first image. The worst thing you can do is try to guess. The worst thing you can do is say, well, what might it be? What, you know, what are the possibilities? Say you're, you're at a, you get a longitude and a latitude and you wanna know what's at that spot. Well, people will look at that and say, well, the latitude is about here, it's gonna be around about this middle of Europe. Well, let's see, what would that be? Uh, maybe the pyramids, That's a, that would be a good target. If you do that kind of thinking, you will get in your way. Don't guess, don't try to elaborate. Another big mistake that people make is they'll get something and they won't know how to interpret it because they're just getting a piece of it, kind of the architectural piece of it maybe. And they won't know how to interpret it. So they'll look at it and they'll say, what's that? Well, they've just gotten in their own way when they say, what's that? If you get something, just write it down and go back. Don't do any what's that. And don't try to make it into something. Oh, I see a bunch of vertical lines. That must be a, you know, a, a fence or you know, make something up. That's not likely to be what it is. But once you start guessing, what is that? I think it's maybe a fence. Now you've locked yourself in and after that you're no longer open. What you do is you make, you make your intent known, your question, what is at these coordinates? What's in the box? You know, what have I drawn on the board here while you were out? Those kinds of things. <clears throat> and your answer will come back immediately. You can check that, but don't, don't base it, don't have any expectation that it's the same thing. You gotta start really from scratch if you're going to ask more than once. Otherwise, you'll just get all wadded up in, oh, I got something different, now which one's right? You see, you get yourself wadded up. So the, the thing that's hard for people to do is just to let go, open themselves to the information, get what's there, but it may come real fast, get what's there, put that down without any judgment or criticism or thinking that it doesn't make any sense. You know, if you just see a bunch of lines zigzagging up and down, well, write the zigzagging lines down and then say, what else? And then you may see lines going this way and you can say, okay, where do they belong relative to the zigzagging lines? And you may put them up on top or on the bottom. Just work at it like that till you get your picture. And uh, when it's all done, that's it. Don't try to make anything of it, that it looks like anything in particular. So those are kind of the keys for remote viewing. You are your own worst enemy in remote viewing. That intellect will want to guess, will want to try to make sense of it, wants to judge, will keep questioning, is this right or did I make that up? You gotta let all that go, no expectation whatsoever. The best attitude is one of being totally disassociated from the result. If, you, if what you want is to get it right, oh, I really want to get this right, I'd like to remote view, I want this target to be right, you'll probably never get it right. The idea that you want to get it right is an expectation. You have this need to get it right, that will get in the way and make you not get it right. So you just have to open yourself and there's the intent. It's like you're a scientist, you're doing an experiment, you have no idea how it will turn out. You're just gonna do it and see what happens. And if you get it right, you get it right, and if you don't, you don't, it's not that important. You see, that's how you end up with beginner's luck. Why do beginners have luck? Because they're not trying. 
They're just doing it. I've never bowled before. I've never rolled a bowling ball. Okay, I'll try it. And you throw it down there and you get a strike. Wow. And it's good until you start thinking that you're good and then it's gone. Now you can't roll one down without getting it in the gutter to save you. Because now you're trying. Before you were just doing without trying. See? So that's important. That's true here. <clears throat> I think the question might be, Tom, and this is off the recording, but I think they were hoping that they might be able to do some remote viewing exercises. I could do one, yeah. but it's a little... I'm thinking of a place where I can, I can draw something and then have you uh, try to guess what it is, but the only place I have to draw is right in plain view of everybody. <clears throat> yeah, give me, give me that pad, Keith, and I'll draw it there. Okay. We can do that. Yeah. Yeah, just give me that. Okay, we can do this, um, but if you don't have the right, you know, the approach and the attitude is everything. The technique is really not to have any technique. The technique is to just open, ask your, you know, have your intent, make it a clear, precise intent, and get whatever you get. All right, uh, we'll do, uh, since this is so easy, we'll do a set of them. It'll only take a few minutes. Um, all right, and you can close your eyes or leave them open or do whatever you want. Most people tend to relax, close their eyes to get rid of extra input and that kind of thing. You don't have to, <clears throat> but I will tell you, okay, I'm going to draw something on this piece of paper and uh, I'll let you know when I'm done and give you a few moments to uh, remote view it. Okay, now see if you can tell me what I've just drawn. That's plenty of time. If you haven't gotten that much time, you're just confusing yourself. So, here's what I drew. Now, you may have just gotten up. You may have gotten bars. You may have gotten any kind of part of this, of this uh, a kind of the architectural sense that this is an up sense, right? So you would have gotten that. You may have gotten Pine trees, you may, you may have gotten any of those sorts of things because what happens, you get the data and then you have to convert that data into something that's in, your, that's in your experience base and turn that into language. Otherwise you can't talk to me or you can't think about what it is that you saw. And all in those processes, there's error. In all of those processes, there's, there's errors involved in them. So um, how many people got this right? Anybody get? Oh, you didn't see it over here. Tom, I heard you say the word bar, and I was close, but then I got a Christmas tree. See, well, it could be trees. Pine trees or trees for this would be good. I saw only lights. Okay. But you got the, see, if you got the vertical lines, that's the major part of the architecture. That means you got the, yeah, you got the data, but then your effort to put it into something that you could think and then talk about it turned into something different than this. <clears throat> well, uh, I got, uh, before you even began the drawing, I got it on, like, like, you know, like dashes. Mm -hmm. But then when I heard the sound of your pen, uh -huh. it went to a board. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. You hear it and you say, oh, okay, you made five strokes. <laughs> and each one was long and then some short ones and then you try to guess it. Yeah, it's hard to keep our mind from doing that. That, that left brain wants to make assessments. That's what it does. It does analysis. And to turn that off is really difficult. See, the way they do this remote viewing for real and a remote viewer is they have a thousand targets. 
these thousand targets are all put in envelopes. The envelopes are not marked. The targets then, the envelopes are all stirred up. They're randomized. Somebody who had nothing to do with those envelopes, was not a part of it in any way, goes over and picks one, takes it to the remote viewer, and they say, what's in the envelope? Or what are the coordinates? There's a piece of paper in here with coordinates on it. What's at those coordinates? They never open the envelope. Nobody ever looks at it. Why do they have that protocol? Not be really because they need to do good science. It is good science. It's double, triple, quadruple blind. But because it makes it easier for the remote viewer if there's no way that he has to guess about it. You see? Because when it's just, what are the coordinates in this envelope? He's got nothing to guess on. You had the sound of my pen to guess on, you see. So you had a little data, and your mind automatically went there. But the protocol for remote viewers is that they get absolutely nothing at all, and that helps them. Yeah. That makes it easier for them. Here you go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So how many of you got at least elements of this? You got some pieces of it. All right, so that's about 75, 80% of you. You see? It's just that easy, isn't it? It's just that easy. Okay? Hmm? Did I think of drawing something else? I may have. My mind may have skipped a couple of things because I said, what would be a good thing to draw that would be easy because. <laughs> That's the next one I was going to draw. See? Remember I said? Okay, these are the people who got it out of order. You want to see what my next one was going to be? Oh, man, this just bled through. I need to do it with a pencil or something. Okay. I was doing it with this marker, and it just bled through. My next one was going to be... I don't know if you'll be able to see this so well because it's now in pencil. But it was concentric circles with the one in the middle colored in. So then you would have had the idea of circles, round things. And you might have said that that was a bullseye or, uh, you know, a watermelon. You know, it's hard to say what, what you might have been turned that into to get it into your language. But uh, you would have had some kind of round thing. That was the next one I was going to do. And why was this the next one? because these are two targets I used when I was in Australia last time and they seem to be work pretty good. The reason they work good is they're basic architectural elements that are simple. You know, if I wrote a sentence out, you know, it's gonna be really hard for you to get that. But if you get something that's simple and direct, all right, I've got another one. Okay, so you can just pick it right out of my head now if you want while I'm thinking about it. You don't have to wait for me to draw it. There are techniques that use different things. Sometimes people see it written on a blackboard or see it on a monitor. You know, that's what they do. They bring up like a, a TV monitor and then they see it there. Uh, some people visualize me turning the page around and saying this is what it is and then they look and see what it is. You see, so they look into the future to get the answer. So there's all kinds of little tools that you can use to help focus your intent on what you're doing. All right, I have another one. Uh, I'll try not to make any noise with this pencil. We go, la, 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 while I'm drawing it, you won't know. <clears throat> okay, I'm going to draw a picture. And uh, you can tell me what it is. Don't look. Okay, now try to try to see what it is that I've drawn. <clears throat> oh, 
All right, let's see what you got. Everybody finishing up? Some people still drawing? Okay, what this is is something that your third grader might bring home from school. What is it they're saying? What is that thing? I've never seen anything like it. Yeah. It's just a, it's a little child's drawing of a horse, right? It's a little stick horse. Okay. Now, I keep it simple because things that are complex aren't good. Now, if I had objects, you like, people like fish like shiny objects. So if you had an object that was shiny and let's say an apple core, that would be a round thing with a bunch of little, like, pie slices in it and a circle in the middle. That's a good one because it's shiny and it's got clear architectural elements in it. Those kinds of things make good targets. Um, I had a, 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 a mathematician in one of my uh, workshops that I did, and I had a thing in a box. I put the thing in a box, and I said, what's in the box? And this guy drew a perfect picture of what was in the box. It was a baby's pacifier. And he drew the nipple, and he drew the circle, and he, didn't, he had some kind of idea that this was a, an exploding star or something that he was drawing. He had no idea what it was. But when he opened it up and it was a pacifier, he just about fell out of his chair because he thought everything that I had said was nonsense and I would made it all up. And then he drew a perfect pacifier. So it's surprising what you can get. So there's lots of little tricks and you'll get better with practice. You'll get better because you'll feel what works and what doesn't work. But your biggest problem will be to get your mind out of, out of the way, to not guess, to take what first comes in your mind. Now, when I did this horse, I suspect that many of you got a rectangle, but didn't get the rest of it. Why did you get a rectangle? Not the rest of it, because I said, take the first thing that comes into your mind. First thing that came into your mind is when I drew the rectangles. That's the first part of this I drew. First you draw the box, and then you draw the rest of it. So. You got the message, there it was. I said, pick the first thing, a rectangle. So you were done. So I would say that you know, just getting the rectangle for this, some kind of boxy shape, would have been the right, would have been the right answer. I, I just got the word animal. Animal, yeah. I just got the word. Yeah, and I guess it's really not much of a horse. It's more of an animal, I think that's probably right. Uh, yeah. So people typically will get pieces of the architectural elements because, again, that's the translation. You get data. You have to interpret it. You have to interpret it based on what's in your database, what's in your memory and experience. And then you have to put it in a language. So it has to be something so you can find a noun to describe it, right? So then you tend to draw it to that thing. So there's lots of errors in that in that process. It's easier just to do coordinates because then you can just go look and see what draws your attention. Okay, well we've done some. Is that, is that good? Okay. And, and the next question? There's a guy over here with a mic. If he's uh -huh. next. Okay. Yeah. Uh, in relation with out of body experience, uh, say if I go there, or the information comes to me? Aha. Okay. There is no such thing outside of this. There is no such thing out of the, in this uh, uh, consciousness system as distance or space. So there really is no travel. The information just gets to you. There's no travel at all. Your interpretation is the motion. That's why when people have NDEs, that's near-death experiences, where they die for a, you know, a few seconds and then get resuscitated, and they have these really strange experiences, often they experience going through a tunnel, a tunnel of light. The, the larger consciousness system is not full of tunnels of light. That tunnel is to give them a sense of motion, 
because they move through a tunnel so they see themselves as going through, they need a background. They need something to make context out of their motion, you see? So that's what the tunnel's for. It's to give them the sense of motion. They create that because they have a belief that if you don't move, you can't get anywhere. You're stuck. So they see something, they want to go there, but the only way they can go there in their belief is to move. Well, when you're in that larger conscious system, the way you get around is by teleporting. It's not really teleporting, you just your intent, you switch data streams. You want to go someplace, you think of that, and you're there. So I call that teleporting, but there's nothing moving. It's just you're switching to different data streams. So getting out of this reality frame and getting into an out-of-body frame is just as simple as switching data streams. You're not going anywhere doing anything. Here's this data stream, you let it go. That's what the meditation's for. Let it go, get into that theta state where you're not connected to this reality. When you let it go, you can reach out and grab a different data stream. How do you reach out and grab a data stream? Well, you have to know it's there. You need an address, just like um, you know, healing. You have to know that you're healing Susie Q, but not any Susie Q, that particular Susie Q. You need to know that you're going to this particular place, which is hard to know if you've never been there. So it's one of these things where you just have to experiment, go, have an experience. You know, it's sort of like when you, when you go to Google, there's always this thing that says, I'm feeling lucky, where you just click on it and it'll just go, gives you some information just out of the database. It's a random draw, basically. Well, you can do that too. You can ask the system, you can say, I'd like to experience something that will help me understand, that'll help me grow up, and then just wait. And there it is. Now, once you've been there, you can always go back because now you can bring up that thought, I want to go to that place, and there you are. So you get around, not by moving, but by attaching to a different data stream. So consciousness isn't in space. There's no space in consciousness. Space is a, is a construct of a virtual reality. You wanna know how to make space? You pick a point, call it an origin, give it three orthogonal unit vectors, and you've got space. That's how you create space. You calculate it. I have another question. Okay. It's related to relativity, physics question. Do you uh, believe the rest frame exists? Do you understand? No. Uh, the rest frame, the, what is time? Ah, I, I say, uh, where the time runs fastest, that is a rest frame. Okay. Time is a, time actually came into being along with consciousness. Time, free will, and consciousness all had to evolve together. Now that's what I called primordial time, not regular time. Okay, all had to evolve together. Because you can't have a consciousness evolving from basically a, an understanding that they could be one, one of two states, a one or a zero, right, a binary. Well, you have to have time. If you're gonna be in this state, then you're gonna be in that state. If you're gonna change, any kind of change requires time because you have a before and an after. So time comes in with the assumption of consciousness. And we can start at that elementary level. It's just an awareness that realized that it was in, or it could be in, one of two states. It could be this way or it could be that way. That simple awareness that knows nothing else other than that is all you need to then evolve the larger consciousness system. But we start with that as an assumption. So my model starts with that assumption. That's the only assumption I have is that consciousness exists and that evolution is a process that exists. Those are the only two assumptions. But you have to start with the assumption that consciousness exists, which means free will exists, otherwise it wouldn't be able to say it can be in this state or that state. Time exists because there's a before and an after with the choice. So all of that comes in with consciousness. Now, it's not a, that's not a failure to have to start with that assumption because we are consciousness. As consciousness, we can't get outside of consciousness. 
that's what we are. We're part of this larger consciousness system, so we can't get out of that system to look back at it in some objective way. You, you're, you're not able to watch yourself being born you know, from the outside. You can't experience it that way because you haven't been born yet. You're not outside. It's the same sort of thing. Beginnings are always mysterious for you if you're the one that just began. So when consciousness began, we can't be there. So it doesn't mean an infinite series. Some people say, oh, well, what, you know, where'd that come from? Where'd that consciousness come from? The answer to that is not that it came from something else that we don't know, which came from something else we don't know. The answer is we just don't know. And it's not that we're not smart enough, it's that there's some things you can't know. And what we can't know is what's outside of the system that contains us. You see, we're in a subset of, the, the larger consciousness system is finite. It's not infinite. It's a finite system. Why is it finite? Because as soon as you call it infinite, you have all kinds of problems with infinite energy and all sorts of infinite things, infinite memory and infinite, and it gets to be <clears throat> imaginary. Anything real has to be finite, but that doesn't mean it isn't very, very big. Just like it's not perfect, but that doesn't mean that in general it has a very low entropy. It does in the executive part, the operating system, if you will. Now again, these are all metaphors, okay? So we just don't know that. So we start with that assumption. That's where the basic primordial time comes from. It comes right in with the assumption. After that, it discovered regular time as a technology to help it order things. Because it could order now things in sequences with regular time. There's lots of things it could do with time as part of its technology that let it construct and build and order. More order, lower entropy. And every virtual reality has its own clock. So in this virtual reality of ours got started, our clock is like 10 to the minus 44 seconds is our little delta T. And that goes with this virtual reality. Some other virtual reality has its own clock. All the virtual realities can have whatever clock makes sense for that virtual reality. But all of them have to be equal to or, well, since we're talking in frequency, we'd say less than, if we're talking about frequency. Um, the fundamental clock, which would be the fastest clock, which would be the larger consciousness system itself, would have the fastest clock. You know, one zero, one zero, one zero, that's a metronome, that's time, that's a clock, and everything else then has to be slower than that or equal to that. Can't get any faster because that's the system clock, if you will. So our virtual reality picked a delta T and a delta X, if you will, increment in time, increment in space, and when it picks those, it does a couple of things. One, it defines C, the speed of light, as fast as you can go through. We said that. The other thing it does is it defines the amount of computer resources required to make the, the simulation. The smaller your delta T and your delta X, the more you've got to calculate, right? The more throughput you have. So the requirements, the computation requirements, are set by picking a delta T and a delta X that work. In general, computer scientists would tell you that you never do a simulation at any more resolution, and resolution is how small is your delta T and how small is your delta X. You never use any more resolution than what you need for the problem, okay? So at first, your delta Ts are bigger. And when this thing was just getting going, right, in the early stages of the evolution after the, the uh, big digital bang and the run button was hit, there wasn't much going on there. It was all just rule set stuff. It wasn't anything really that allowed for choices. So if I were the system, I'd have a real big delta T so it could run through time in a hurry to get to the part that was more interesting. And once it started to get more interesting and detailed, I'd give it a smaller delta T because I'd be interested in the detail, you see. And physicists call that inflation, where it seemed to go very, very fast in the beginning. It's like time went real fast in the beginning. So time is a technology, but time comes in with the assumption. And there's nothing we can do about that because we have to start with consciousness 
nothing we can do about that because we are consciousness and can't get outside to look back at it objectively. So we have to start with an assumption that it exists. But it's not a real big jump of an assumption. It's just that consciousness exists, and since we all think we're conscious, then consciousness exists is not so hard. Then the question is, where did, you know, how did it get to the way it is? And then you start with this simple little reality cell, I'll call it, of, a, of an awareness of being able to be in state one or state two, which then it can evolve to more states and more things and more complication, or it could disappear if everything became random, no information. So then it's a matter of this thing just evolving, its awareness growing and so on. So it started as a very, very dim awareness and has been evolving ever since, and we're a part of it. So it's a, it's a normal instead of supernormal occurrence. It's finite, it's imperfect, it's not done yet, and we're a piece of it. So that keeps it all uh, nice and tidy and, and uh, without loose ends. Yes? It was a wonderful le uh, lecture. The way you integrated both science and spirituality into consciousness as being the soul source of everything. And in the Advaita or non-duality teaching, we are, uh, they tell us the same thing, uh, like spiritually, mm -hmm. that it's the awareness of consciousness which is the source of everything. That is mm -hmm. what we are. So, like when you were uh, um, uh, telling us about uh, dealing with fear, for example. Uh, one way, like in the non-duality teaching, is the self-inquiry. So when we have fear, uh, rather than uh, just dealing with the fear, we go back to the. We try to go back to the source of the fear. Mm -hmm. Like, who is it, or what is it that is observing the fear? Mm -hmm. What is it that is fearful? Is that thing which is fearful? Uh, is that, that thing which is observing? Is it fearful itself? So every time, whether it is with fear, fear or anger or lust or whatever. We are trying to go back to the source, yeah. which is the... That, that is helpful, and a lot of people do that, and there's some comfort in finding the source. Oh, you know, like my son, he was a toddler, just barely able to walk. We went to visit friends. They had a big dog, you know, a big 150-pound dog, and my son just fell over because that's how old he was. So he fell down a lot, so he fell over, landed on his back, and this big dog walked up and looked at him and just looked at him and said, you know, what's the matter, kid? You know, did you fall over? Sort of thing, a big friendly dog. My son screamed and grew up to be terrified of dogs. The dog was not threatening, so it was all in his mind. Okay, now it was, it was helpful for him to understand that. I could tell him how that happened. He could rationalize that, and I got him a little puppy, which grew up to be a big dog, and as the process of it grew up, he got over his fear of dogs. But then it was helpful to go back and see what was the cause of that. Sometimes the causes are too hard to get to. Sometimes the causes are wrapped up in so much trauma, so much angst and unhappiness and other things, that trying to get to the cause almost ends up in a blame game. And blame is not useful at all. See, that's just the ego. So sometimes getting to the cause grabs hold of that ego and won't let it go. So I tell people that, yes, you have to own it. You have to understand it. And if you go back to the cause, that's good if you can do that and that works for you. But if you can't, that's okay too. Just own it and go on. The cause doesn't have to be known. You don't really have to know what the cause was. My son could have just said, I'm afraid of dogs. I don't know why, but I want to overcome it. And then he could have gotten a little tiny chihuahua or something that he could get used to without being afraid of, and then maybe something a little bigger and something a little bigger. He could have worked his way out of it on his own by himself one day. It was easier the way, he, you know, the way we did it. But there's more than one way to skin that cat. You can, you can find out the source or you can let the source go. If you can find out the source and let's say, let's say it was something your parent did to you, you know, something that somebody did that frightened you or scared you or did something and you can go back and realize, well, that was silly. You know, it's like the big dog. You know, the dog didn't hurt him. That was kind of silly, but that was your emotional connection at the time. 
then that can be helpful. You can put that back, or you can go back and say, yeah, well, that's what my mother did to me, but she was just doing the best she could with what she had. You know, she had her own issues she was dealing with, and that's okay. I forgive you, Mom. Then that may allow you to go on. But sometimes that's too hard to do for people, and it's not always necessary. But when you can do it, it's good because then you get closure. You actually get closure on the event that created the problem. But you can still let it go without closure, just by letting it go, just by not going there anymore. And you may never know why. It may have come from a past life or 10 past lives ago. It's hard to say where your fears come from. And it isn't necessary to find out. But I'd agree with you. It's good to find out when you can and when that helps. But I've had people that got hung up on finding out. And then they got in ego loops because they were trying to find somebody to blame for why they were that way rather than just accepting it, that that's the way they were. Can I just extend to uh, extent of that extension that the moment we intend to get over, overcome our fear is mm -hmm. the moment either we are ready to move on. And is that so? Not that always. The intent no. also matters? It depends, it depends on what you mean by intent. You see, there's this little I intent, which is your intellect. That intellect can say, I'm going to get rid of this fear. This fear is making my life difficult. I want to get rid of it. And you really intend to get rid of it. But that can be at your intellect, not at the being level, you see. So you can intend to get over it and still take you a long time. Then I would say that intent, that intellectual intent, is the first step in getting over it. But when you finally get to the being level where you let it go or accept it, now you get over it. So if your intent was the capital I intent that's down here at the being level, then yes. If it was the intellectual little I intent, then no. So intent to let it go would mm -hmm. help. Would help. An intent to let it go will help. And if, you keep, if you keep that intent, yeah. if you always keep that pressure on, mm. you see, your intent modifies future probability. If you always keep that intent, yes, I'm going to let this go. Catch yourself when you're doing it. Back away from it. Keep that intent. That's keeping this positive pressure on to reduce the probability of you reacting that way. And eventually, you just won't react that way anymore. Yeah, the conscious in, effort is, of course, every time it is. What's that? Conscious effort. You are consciously changing the... Yes. Yeah, every consciously time. make. Yeah, every yeah. time. Every time you add a little bit more. Yeah, in moving. That. Yeah. Yes. So probably. I'm yeah, just adding on. Just wanted to know. Yes. Wait a minute. We got one over here first. Yes, Tom, I wanted to ask you when you talk about past lives and you also mentioned future lives, mm -hmm. uh, in the context of the IUOC, which is the individual you know, mm -hmm. consciousness, uh, does the IUOC have to remain an IUOC? Or is it uh, really a self in that sense? Or can it amalgamate with other IUOCs? How long does the IUOC remain an IUOC? The IUOC is Individuated Unit of Consciousness, in case you're wondering. <laughs> yeah. Did you get the question now? I'm not sure. How long does it have to remain? An, IU, uh, an Individuated Unit of Consciousness, um, that's what it is. And it stays that way. But it has different things that it can do. Okay, it's your collection. The individual unit of consciousness is your collection of all your past lives. Those past lives come together and it becomes one whole thing. So here you are, you get, you have a, what I call a free will awareness unit. Maybe I should just go through this whole thing. Okay, what are you and how does this cycle go around? Keep in mind, metaphors, right, that I'm talking about. All right, you have this, Individuated unit of consciousness. It's at a certain level, has a certain amount of entropy. It's been through a bunch of lives before, and now it's ready to do another one. So we're going to start there and go all the way through the circle where you die and come back. Okay, so what it does is it takes a part of its being level, not its intellect, just its being level, and it logs in to this virtual reality game with just its being level piece, a subset, not all of its being level, just a piece. Okay. That being level has its quality, the amount of you know, entropy reduction it's achieved up to that point. Now that free will awareness unit then is the 
player for that avatar, that physical avatar. That free, that free will awareness unit kind of is logged in to a particular avatar, but it has no memory, no intellectual component at all, just basic quality of substance of the IUOC, individual unit of consciousness. All right, now that baby grows up, gets experience, makes decisions, makes choices. Well, the baby doesn't, the consciousness does, right? The free will awareness unit is making all the choices for that, for that avatar. It grows up. So let's say it makes good choices. And as it makes better choices, the, its entropy lowers. So it evolves its quality. Now it gets to the end of its life. The avatar, because it, it follows the rule set, the avatar dies because the rule set only has them last for so long. And that free will awareness unit finds itself in another reality frame. And its memory of what it just had, of what it just did, of its lifetime starts to fade like a dream. So it first, right instantly, it remembers everything in every detail and then it gets less and less, just like your dreams when you wake up, they get foggier and foggier the longer you've been awake. So it starts to fade. And as that this past lifetime uh, fades, it begins to reintegrate with its individuated unit of consciousness. Okay? Now that individuated unit of consciousness has all this new experience that it got from that free will awareness unit. And it integrates that. And it says, okay, take this with everything else I've got. You know, this, is, this was a good one. It uh, reduced entropy. Now the whole uh, individuated unit of consciousness has a lesser entropy. It's learned lessons. It's done things. So now it's a little higher level on that evolutionary scale. Okay? And now it decides, okay, here are my strengths. Here are my weaknesses. I'd like to do it again. And I need to work on these things. So it kind of arranges for an incarnation that'll help it work on those things, perhaps, if it's a little more advanced. And uh, uh -huh. that's poetic justice, that the person asking the question gets interrupted by the phone, yes. Anyway, so then it, it goes back again, takes another piece of itself, right, without its intellect, but that's now at a little higher quality because of the last incarnation raised it up a little bit and you go through the same process again. So the individuated unit of consciousness is always an individuated unit of consciousness. It doesn't change, it doesn't become anything else, but it does take a piece of itself, let that be the free will awareness unit and it grows and evolves and it can connect with other IUOCs and get data and information it connects with uh, the larger system to, to help it find out what would be a good next adventure for it in this, you know, where, sh where should it log in, that kind of thing. So it's a fully operable piece of consciousness with memory, with you know, processing power, connections, and whatever, and so is this little piece. Now, a lot of people give these different names. A lot of times the free will awareness unit is the soul. A lot of times the individuated unit of consciousness is either the oversoul or the higher self or the, you know, something like that. Uh, there's lots of ways that you can name them. But all these names, I caution, are just metaphors. The way this model works is that it's a logical model. Consciousness has logical processes, and in order for us to talk about it, we've got to give it names and metaphors so we can turn it into language so we can have a discussion. So these things, like a free will awareness unit, it's a logical necessity in the model, so we give, it a, we give it a name. We call it a free will awareness unit. But don't think about free will awareness units and individuated units of consciousness as being these little things somewhere up in the great void that are doing stuff. It's just a, a logical description of the functions of consciousness. So does that answer it? Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you, Tom, for the very insightful lecture you gave us. Uh, my question is that uh, in India we have, a, you know, a philosophy which has been enunciated in Bhagavad Gita, which is quite similar to what you are talking, where every uh, human being is an unit of consciousness, which is called as Krishna consciousness, mm -hmm. and there is a theory of karma and so on. So how different or similar is big? your big theory of everything to this uh, 
you know, Bhagavad Gita philosophy. I mean, one point of difference which I see is that in that book, we are told that eventually we are all meant to merge with the source. Our point of mm -hmm. getting born and reborn is to keep improving, purifying, whatever mm -hmm. you call it. And eventually, at some stage, you'll be liberated from this cycle of birth and re, you know, rebirth. Mm -hmm. And that's what... But you said that you can never do that because entropy can never... You know, you can reduce the entropy, but you can never be zero. Hmm. Well, okay. I mean, this gives us yeah. some kind of point yeah, that you're born a, and reborn, and eventually, you know, you yeah, get liberated. There, so. Yeah, there is a there is a difference there. You see, one idea is that you improve, right, and then you become merged with the source. Okay, so then you lose that identity, then remerges, and the source is springing off new individuated units of consciousness down at some other level will go back in the game but you're not part of it anymore you're merged with the source okay now if you think of this in terms of a computer metaphor or just an information system as i do there's no um there's really no value to the system in that you see there's no value added to that process you are an individual unit of consciousness. You can continue to evolve. You never get the zero entropy. There's always something to learn and do. But you become more and more like the source, obviously, the more you grow up. The source is a very low entropy consciousness. You are consciousness, just like it is. Uh, as you grow more and more, you get the abilities, just like it does. So you become more and more like the source. But then to take that that's been developing and evolving and stop its evolution to take its bits and put them back in the, you know, back in the memory bank so you can use them for something else doesn't seem to me to be profitable. So I would think that, yes, you do become more and more like the source. And you might say figuratively or metaphorically that you merge with it in the sense that you become like it. But you are an entity that has been evolving the whole system is evolving. You see, I think, I think the, the idea that the system isn't evolving, it's just a fixed system. And when you get to where it is, you just merge with it. The system isn't fixed, in my metaphor. The system is still evolving itself. The whole thing is alive and evolving and growing, always. So there's no reason for you to dissolve into the source. You just become a lot like the source. Now, what, what do you do? Well, you still can be helpful, but there's a lot of ways to be helpful. There are entities who never incarnate into a virtual reality. They do other things. They evolve in other ways. There's other work to be done, you know, other than coming here and doing this. So this is just one of the paths, and there's lots of other virtual realities. This physical reality is only one of many physical realities. This is not the only game in town. So my way of thinking is that you as an entity don't run out of jobs to do. There's always some way, other way to help. Maybe you're helping as part of the management system. You see, you have this operating system, which is, I call the larger conscious system. It's got tasks to do. It's got a, you know, it's, it's got a, uh, you know, it's, it's got a business to run, right? It's in the business of evolving. It's what created this virtual reality that's our physical reality. It keeps track of things. It's, uh, you know, it's helping you when you need help. When you say, I, you know, I'd, I'd like to grow up, what can I do next? You know, it's giving you information, creates databases, it makes the whole thing work. So you need an operating system that is smarter and more evolved than everything else to be in charge. But besides that, you have to have other entities in charge as well. And in my books, I talk about, from my own explorations, that there are, you know, I, I make a, meta, a business metaphor, and I call this, this area that we're in an end division. There's lots of, you know, there's N plus one and N plus two. There's lots of divisions. And there is a manager, if you will, over end division. And there's several reality frames like this one in end division. And the end division does certain kinds of experiment and growth at certain places, and others do others kind of thing. So you can be in that infrastructure. You know, you might say you'd be a civil servant, right, for the, for the uh, you know, you become 
part of the bureaucracy of the larger consciousness system, but you'd be a civil servant perhaps. There's other things to do other than just be here that are choice making things that allow you to evolve. So you're not always going to be here. You may do something else or you may come back here to help some way. There's always, I think, a, another job. I don't think you ever run out of things to do. So I don't see the value in throwing away what you've got and not having that entity anymore. So that'd just be a disagreement, but I'd call that a very minor disagreement. You know, with these models, we're make, I'm making a model. My model takes what I see as consciousness and tries to make a logical connection of why all these things have to be that way and couldn't be some other way. Like uh, reincarnation is part of the model, has to be that way. You can't have the model work without that because that's the learning, that's the growing. So it's a part of it. And it's a part because it's logical and necessary. And then I don't see that it's logical and necessary to have that part actually merge and go away. But metaphorically, I don't think it really makes any difference. It could work like that, you see? So I'm not saying, oh, I'm right and that's wrong. I'm just saying there are different models, ways of looking at it. And at that level, we're picking nits over details that really don't matter very much. So I have a little argument with, with any of that. And yes, me and the Bhagavad Gita and the sutras and all the other things, the Vedas, we agree on all the fundamentals. All the fundamentals seem to be about the same. There's no big difference between any of it. I didn't discover that. I just found it out for myself in my own way, in my own space. You know, it'd been around for a long time. But that there's differences in the way we model it? Sure. Does it matter? Not really. What matters is that we know what we're here about and what we're doing and that we do that. And all the rest of it is more conjecture and how we want to draw up the model. So yeah, there is that basic difference. That's probably one of the major differences between MBT, my big toe, and uh, the Hindu worldview of what's going on is that I don't have that ending. I don't see an ending because the whole thing is going. And I think maybe that it's hard to get that idea that the whole thing is still evolving unless you begin with a metaphor of an information system because now you know that's what informations do. So it's partly my metaphors drive the model as well, my understanding. So we just use different metaphors for the same thing. And a little time, sometimes they aren't exactly the same, but that's okay. It's just a model. Yeah, that's one of the things I tell people. I said, don't believe that the model is reality. This is a model of reality. The model is not reality. You see, don't confuse the model of reality with reality. It's just a model. And models can be changed. You get more information, you update them. I mean, a model is just a way of putting things in a structure so that we can understand them and talk about them. Hi, Tom. Lovely talk. Very insightful. I wanted to ask, like, we have been talking of the database, okay, that we access when we have to manifest reality. Mm -hmm. We go on to access the database from the past. Mm -hmm. Now, what I've observed that suppose somebody is having at present a miserable reality. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, is this past database some kind of the same subconscious programming or beliefs that are there? Like suppose, sup just for an example, suppose a child believes that uh, his parent doesn't love that child. Mm -hmm. okay? So whenever that child is manifesting reality, all the time is it is misery because he's accessing from his past his mm -hmm. belief system has become so mm -hmm. that the parent doesn't love me my right. father doesn't love me or my mother doesn't love me mm -hmm. whatever so for that child when i try to change the belief system of that child that mm -hmm. look to the intent don't look to the action it mm -hmm. doesn't work so many times because constantly they are accessing that database right. wherein the belief system has set in that the parent doesn't mm -hmm. love me. 
Right. So is there any system in which we can actually change the belief yes. of the subconscious See, the, program? Here the belief is, is based on fear. Most beliefs are fear-based. It's like your ego is fear-based. It's fear that produces most beliefs and the ego. So what do you do with that when somebody has their ego or their beliefs wrapped around something so tightly that you can't pry it loose? You, ha you realize it is a fear and the only thing you can do is put them in such a safe place that they can learn to let that fear go. In other words, if you say, oh, your mother does love you, that doesn't help at all because they know that's not true. And you can point out things. Oh, look, your mother did this for you, did that for you. You know, your mother did all these things for you. Of course she loves you. That isn't helpful. You see, that's like giving them a lecture. That's intellectual. Their, their problem is not an intellectual problem. Their problem is at the being level. And trying to interface with it from the intellect isn't going to work. Matter of fact, it makes it worse. Because as you tell them that it's not true, in their mind, that just reinforces the truth of it. So that approach makes things worse. The thing you can do is you just hold that child and hug them and say, well, I love you. I don't know about your mother. I think she probably loved you too, but I don't know. But I love you. I will always love you and be unconditional in your love for that child. And the first thing that child will do is to test that to see whether it really is unconditional because they won't believe you. So the first thing they'll do is, you know, knock something over and spill water all over the floor and make a mess or be rude or something like that and see if you still love them then. And if you still love them then, eventually they'll begin to soften and they will accept that love and that is the only thing that's going to help them. Telling them about, see that's again, you know, it's the source of the problem sometimes it's just too painful to go there and deal with. Sometimes you just have to deal with the, the feeling and the fear. But if you put him in a safe space of love, he has the highest probability of being able to grow out of it slowly. He has to earn, you know, you have to earn that trust and that love. He has to really feel like you are going to love him forever, period, unconditionally. And when he feels that, then he'll begin to let that go. And it won't matter that you're not his mother. He'll just let it go, you see. And the whole <coughs> fear will disappear. Whether he ever, you know, comes to grips with his mother or not is almost not relevant. It's the fear that's the problem. So that's the way that you can deal with that. But most people try to tell him that's not true. Somehow thinking that in his intellect he'll say, oh yes, look, mom did do that. I guess she did love me after all. But see, if, if it were an intellectual problem, that would work, but it's not. It's a fear problem, and fear is not rational. So you can't solve an irrational problem with a rational solution. Those two won't work. Do affirmations work here? Because a lot of people, I mean, what I've read about and learned about is that, you know, tell them to work with affirmations. <clears throat> affirmations state, yeah. will work a little bit. It depends. Sometimes they will work and sometimes they won't. Depends on the individual. If you have them do an affirmation and they're just going through the motions of doing an affirmation because you've told them to and they go, no, I don't want to. And you say, yes, you need to. Here's the affirmation. Do it. If their heart isn't in it, if they're not connected to it, they're just doing it because they have to. Somebody is forcing them to do something. <coughs> It'll just make it worse. In that case, the affirmation will make it worse. Not only his mother didn't love him, but other people are trying to bully him into doing things he doesn't want to do. So nobody else loves him either. See, so that becomes a, a problem in itself. Now, if you have a child that is open to being positive, they're not that damaged psychologically, that they're open to positive things and positive thoughts, then if they constantly say things that are positive, it makes the positive more likely to be there. You know, it's like, um, you know, if you, if you tell a lie often enough, eventually, you know, you and everybody else will believe it. You know, an affirmation works like that, except it's positive. <coughs> say something positive, and that can help if 
they actually take those words to heart at the being level, if it means something to them. If it doesn't, it can hurt them more than it helps them. So sometimes that works, but you have to know the child and know what that reaction is going to be. You're as likely to hurt them as not. Depends on how deep that wound is. <coughs> Who has it? Yes. Namaste, sir. Namaste. Hello. Uh, I want to ask about aura. How can we see anyone's aura or our own aura? And how can we know about any person why seeing his aura or her own aura? Okay. <coughs> how do you do it? How do you see an aura, and How can we see, yes. what sort of information can you get, yeah. and why can you get it? I guess we can talk about that. An aura is just information in a database. The, the visual of, <coughs> that you see of the colors and light around a person, <coughs> excuse me, or around other things, not only people have auras, lots of things have auras. <coughs> that's just the output format, that's the default output format. You start with an intent to be aware of someone's, let's say, health energy or their spiritual energy or whatever. And with that intent, that's the intent to the database. And then you can also have an intent of how you'd like that displayed. If you don't specify the display, you'll get it as the colors in the ores. That's the default. <coughs> now, if you want to do this for a self-centered reason, Oh, you want to take advantage of somebody, so you really want to know, you know, uh, where their illness is, or where, you know, where their weak points are, or whether they are falling in love with you, or whether they like you or not. You know, you got some kind of thing that you want to know because your ego would like to know it. Then the system isn't going to be very helpful for you to do that. Matter of fact, the system may just frustrate your attempts to do that. If, on the other hand, you just want to see it, you just want to experience that data and understand it, then the system will be more helpful for you. So it's a matter of, it's, it's sort of like the remote viewing and the healing. It's a matter of attitude. <clears throat> you don't actually, so you're not actually looking at a, the aura isn't there. You just see it around the person. The body isn't really there either, you see. The body you're looking at isn't there any more than the aura is there. It's all just information. You're getting information that then you're interpreting. So none of it is actually there. That's why you don't need a photograph or you don't need the person or anything else because it's just information. So <clears throat> you have an intent to gather certain information. You should have a reason why. Why do you have that intent? You know, what's behind that? What's your purpose? The purpose is good. <coughs> the system will cooperate. Your worst enemy is yourself because you start to see something so oh was that real did I just make that up well now you've just chased it away so if you can open yourself be skeptical and just the same way we do with the remote viewing not get in your own way it's just information from a database and anybody can access it the same difficulties you have remote viewing are the same things that make it difficult for you to see auras it's your intellect gets in the way you judge it too soon. You need to just let it, let it be. Collect the data and not judge it. You'll see something and you wonder, did I make that up? You see, instead of, you ought to just see it and say, well, that's interesting. Let me see it around somebody else, see if it's the same. So just take data. Just collect data. Don't judge it. After you've done it and worked with it for a few months, now you can start judging and see, does it make sense? You know, is there a pattern here? Certain things that I see, uh, do they mean anything? But don't try to get into that in the first times you see it. Don't try to reproduce the pictures that you see in, in books. Just do it in your own way and get the data. Sometimes people who are not visual, they don't really see the aura so much as they feel it. That's okay too. So feeling is another way of getting data and interpreting it. There's nothing really there to see. These are virtual eyes. 
<laughs> in a virtual world. None of, that is, none of that is real. All of that's an illusion. So it's just information. You can feel the information or you can see the information. You can hear the information. You can even feel it sometimes. So relax. Let it come to you. And why can you get it? Why would that information be? Isn't that an invasion of privacy of some sort? Well, no, it's just information. It's available to everybody, for everybody. It's just the way it is. But people generally can't access it until they've grown up enough that they don't abuse it. There are some exceptions. But the system's kind of self-policing that way. If you, if you have a a not so good purpose in mind, then you don't get very good at it. And you end up getting a lot of things that aren't true mixed in with it. So have a good purpose and uh, take time to do it. And just, just intend to do it. It's just that simple. Just intend to do it. You just intend to see it. That you say, I have an intent. You know, you want to look at my energy, just have an intent to see the energies around me. And if you see something, good. Then work with that. Don't question it. If you don't see anything, then try it again. You see? It just, eventually, you will see these things. And when it'll happen is when you've given up trying. When you say, ah, it doesn't work. I never see anything. And then you'll look and pff, there or something will be. And then you go, oh, what was that? And now it'll be another month before you see anything again because it's got you back, it's got your ego involved in it, you see? So it's a, it's a way of, of being open without being judgmental, without attaching, without doing analysis, just entirely open without attachment. That's the way you see it. And you, all you have to do is intend to. It's the same way without a body. You're gonna go to out of body, there's no big thing you have to do to get out of your body. All you have to do is change data streams. Let this data stream go, pick up another one. It's just that simple. So when you are a beginner, you spend hours meditating. You spend a long time in a meditation just getting ready. You know, you get in the right position, you burn the incense, you, you, know, you ring a bell, you do whatever you do. You lie down, you go through all this stuff. You go through relaxation exercises, you know, you play the binaural beats, you go through all of this stuff. Eventually, you can get to that same point consciousness state in one hundredth of a second and then come back again. It's just there. It's just switching data streams. It's quick and we make it difficult with our, with our intellect. We create all the difficulty in doing these things. They're really very simple. I know that frustrates people to no end, you know, that, oh, it's really simple because they say, I've been working on this for a decade and haven't been successful but it's because you get in your way. The success comes from not trying to do it, just being open to it and let it happen on its own. The trying to do it is your ego wants to do it. Your ego has an expectation. That want to do it gets in the way of doing it. So how can you do it without wanting to do it? Well, I guess that's the secret of one hand clapping, right? The old Zen cone. So you just have to have an intent at the being level without the intellect involved, open, accept what you get, whatever it is, and that's all there is to it. I know, it just sounds impossible, doesn't it? But uh, that's, it is just that easy. You, if you can just get out of your own way and let it happen. It's that ego that's the tough thing to get rid of. And beliefs. Uh, this one question that uh, are there lives in other planets, other galaxies? Ah, okay, that's a good question. There is a, uh, well, I guess I'll answer the question directly before I go into the something else, but uh, possible, not certain at all. There is more evidence, so to speak, that there are not than there is that there is. And here's why. There's a thing called the Fermi Paradox. The Fermi Paradox was brought up over lunch with Enrico Fermi and his team of scientists. And what, uh, what Fermi said was he said, well, look, 
we are in an old part, uh, I mean a, a rather new part of the universe. We have this big universe, lots of galaxies, lots of stars, billions of places that you could have life perhaps. There's no reason to think we're special. With all of these stars and all these planets, certainly there's something evolved someplace else. Okay, given that, he said, where are they? Other parts of this universe are billions of years older than us. Evolution is a thing that works with time. Okay, so if it was just a matter of other places being able to evolve things, well, that part of the universe that's a couple of billion years older than us should have evolved things a long time ago. Now, where do you think we might be a billion years from now? Well, that's too far. You know, we can't even imagine that, right? So he said, well, even if light speed is something that can't be conquered, and these people evolved to the point like we did with technology, we go to the moon, we send out things, and if they evolved that far, and they could just go to the next system that could support them, and the next, and the next, so they just traveled out one at a time, very slowly, sublight speeds, still, even under the worst circumstances, they'd be here now. A lot of those systems that are older than ours, billions of years of migrating out, they'd be here in lots of numbers. So Enrique Fermi's paradox was, where are they? Where are the ETs, you see? Why aren't they around? They should have been here by now. Well, <coughs> here's one answer to that paradox. And this was a, if you look up the um, Fermi paradox, you'll find this on Google. And there's been a lot of philosophers and scientists who have tried to solve the Fermi paradox because it's really a very strong paradox. Even if you make the worst possible assumptions about growth being 10 times slower and evolution, you know, and problems with meteorites setting people back, you go through all the bad things could possibly happen and they still should have been here a long time ago. So it's a very strong logical paradox and there hasn't been any solutions yet that have really held water. Four, five, six, maybe 10 different solutions people have put forward, mathematicians and others, logicians, and there's, <coughs> they never really can explain where are they. Here's an explanation. The larger consciousness system provided this virtual reality because it had a use for what, seven and a half billion seats in this game? Maybe go up to, you know, 10 billion, who knows? But that's it. They didn't need any more seats than that. That's all the free will awareness units that they really had to put here because they had other games, other places, whatever, and that's all they needed. Well, when you do a virtual reality, you get the whole thing. The whole universe comes with it. It all evolves together. And then you'd think, what a waste. All of those suns and all those planets and nothing going on just here. It's not like that at all, you see. All of those planets are just a speck of light. They're not there until there's somebody to see them, to make a measurement. They don't exist. Just like this wall behind me isn't in my data stream when I'm facing you. It's in your data stream, but not mine. If nobody's here, that wall's not in anybody's data stream. Does that mean that wall disappears? No, it means that wall was never there in the first place. It's just data in a data stream, you see? There is no wall. It's an illusion. It's data in a data stream. It's your interpretation of the data. So now I'm not getting the data. Well, I'm not getting the data from what's in some other galaxy, some other place, neither is anybody else. Well then, what does the system do? Nothing. There's nothing there that it has to create just to create it, just like it doesn't create this wall in my data stream. And once we all go home and this room's empty, it doesn't create that wall in anybody's data stream. The wall isn't real, it's a virtual wall. It's only in our mind. We create that wall from the data we get, you see? So this universe with all of its billions of stars and galaxies and super galaxies, those can, own, those can be done with just a few bits of code. And it just lights in the sky. And when it's daytime, they're not even lights in the sky, you see? So when we come around and we look up in the sky, well, there they are. 
we get a big telescope and we look up there, ah, oh, we see the dust, we see the nebulae, we see all these other things, we turn the telescope off, they're not rendered anymore, they're not in anybody's data stream. You see, the virtual reality only exists as our free will and awareness unit senses it. That data is created on the fly in our data stream and we interpret it. We look someplace else, that data is not created. It's not saved, it's not stored. We look back, it's recreated, put in our data stream again. And that's really a hard thing for people to understand. But a year ago, No Man's Sky was a virtual reality that worked just like that. There was over, a, I don't know, 100 quintillion planets in this universe in No Man's Sky. Every one of them had its own features, its own fauna, its creatures, its plants. All these creatures and plants evolved. So if you went there and then went there later, they'd be a little different. Evolution would have changed things. <coughs> and when nobody's looking, it's gone. It's not stored anywhere. It just gets recreated. Somebody looks, it's recreated. So you're there on that planet and you look this way, your data stream gets that. Your data stream <coughs> for what was on the other side, it's gone. Nothing's, it's called, it's um, procedural programming. It's a new kind of programming where everything gets created on the fly just as you need it. Well, if you play with that program, you'll, you'll get a much better idea of how this reality works. You see, all those quintillion worlds that it has <coughs> don't exist anywhere except when you look at them. So the computer doesn't have to sit there rendering, you know, quintillions of worlds. It only has to render what somebody looks at. There's no players in the game. The server doesn't have to render anything. So, we don't have, yes, we have this huge universe with all these suns and all these planets, and certainly some other life might have been there, unless that just wasn't necessary. The system didn't need that many seats in this particular entropy reduction trainer. Now, if it needed more seats in this trainer, then perhaps it would put life someplace on one of those planets around one of those suns, because it would give it a bunch more seats, right? And then we'd have these two games going, like independent games, and then if they and us ever met, then it could be an interaction between us and all that would be part of a bigger virtual reality. But the Fermi paradox says that should have happened by now because we're in a new part of the universe, or at least the middle-aged part of the universe, not the old part. So the logic and the statistics then are really in favor of us being it. It's here for us. Just for us and the rest of it doesn't take but a few bits to create when somebody points a telescope at it for a few minutes. The telescope gets turned off, it disappears again. So it's no bits wasted, no extra calculation. It's not a big deal. It's easy to do because it's a virtual reality. So you see, that's the thing. When Fermi thought about it, he, the, th the thought was that it, there has to be because otherwise it would be a huge waste. Just this one little tiny sun in this huge universe and it's the only one that has people on it? Ridiculous. But that's because he didn't understand it was a virtual reality and there is no waste. None of that stuff's being computed anyway. Not in our data streams, you see. So that gives a solution to the Fermi paradox and kind of answers your question about in the outer space. Maybe there are. And if the system needed more seats in this trainer, it could certainly produce them there, could support them. But how many seats do you need? Well, I don't know. You know, limited. I know there's other whole universes like this. I've been other places that are different than this. So, could be, probably not. And that's another, there's another thing called the anthropic principle in physics that says that in order for this universe to work, we found that there are like a half a dozen constants, <clears throat> speed of light I think is one of them, that you, that we have to like 10, 15 decimal places. And these constants have everything balanced just so that our reality is stable. You know, that hydrogen doesn't break down and other elements fall apart. We have these constants. And if the constant was just a little bit different in the 14th decimal place, our whole universe would disintegrate and wouldn't be able to be stable. 
Okay, and the idea is called the anthropic principle because it looks like it was made just for us. Here we are, these carbon-based, you know, uh, units here that we've evolved to be, <coughs> and our life and our support and our existence is based on all these constants being just so. And it's a big mystery. Why would that be like that? How could it be so finely tuned just to permit us to be here in a stable environment? Well, I can imagine, you know, it's a big bang, take one. Oh, that wasn't stable. After a billion years, it fizzled out and broke. Oh, let's adjust the constants just a little bit. All right, big bang, take two. You see, the rule set itself evolved, got tuned just to make this virtual reality last long enough that it could be interesting for the system. It didn't get interesting around here until critters got to the point that they were making choices interesting for the conscious players to play. <clears throat> so the first few billion years, this universe didn't really have any players. It was all in the computer. Then we started getting critters making decisions. Consciousness could play them. Then we got this human critter that made all kinds of decisions, right? Big potential decision space. But the universe had to be stable enough to allow it to evolve that long to get, you know, to produce this. So it had to be fine-tuned to, to enable it to do that. So that's another paradox solved with the virtual reality. It may be just for us, tuned specifically to last long enough to be useful as an entropy reduction trainer. Yes. <coughs> Hi, Tom. It's a real pleasure to meet you. The question that I have right now is that uh, we, I guess we all saw this, but post 9-11, a lot of conspiracy theorists mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. woke up and documentaries like Thrive by Procter Gamble and all came up, which spoke about how I understand that all of us already live in a lot of fear, but it spoke about how a certain set of people are trying to inflict that fear further on us or are also keeping things like free energy and stuff away. What, what are your thoughts on that? <coughs> like conspiracy theories? Conspiracy theories tend to generate a lot of fear. So I don't find them a good idea, and most, mostly because they generate fear. That's beside whether or not they're true or not. It's not the issue. They generate a lot of fear, which is damaging to people. <clears throat> we have become <coughs> very fearful, much more fearful. I don't know how it is in India, but we in the United States have become a very fearful people. And that's not been by accident. There's been a lot of of that generated on purpose. Why? Because fear is a handle by which you can be manipulated. You understand somebody's fear, you can get them to do what you want. Everything uses that handle to manipulate you. Advertisements, you know, will show you that if you don't go out and get this brand of beer, nobody will like you. But if you do get this brand of beer, then all the girls will come over and want to kiss you, you see? Fear. Fear that you don't measure up. Fear that the girls won't like you. Fear that you're not all that socially adept. So the message is preying on that fear to get people to spend their money on that product. So advertisers want to make us afraid so they can manipulate us. Politicians want to make us afraid so that they can manipulate us. Many religions want to make us afraid because they want to manipulate us. The law, the legal system, you know, you, you put on a, a movie, a, a DVD movie, and the first thing you see is what terrible things are gonna happen to you if you copy this DVD. That's try to manipulate you, to get you to do what they want, or not do what they don't want. So we are being frightened from all over the place. You don't need a conspiracy theory to come to that conclusion. Every organization that has power and wants to manipulate people, no matter what it is, whether it's the clergy or whether it's you know, politicians or advertisers, whoever, 
use fear to manipulate because that is the only thing that lets you manipulate people. It's gotten a lot worse once we had media with a long reach. You see, it used to be that people never went more than about 100 miles from where they were born. And the politicians would come, they'd stand up on a bucket in the town square, they'd holler as loud as they could for people to hear them, and maybe 50 or 100 people would, would hear what they had to say. It was very limited. Now you go on news, you broadcast it to 300 million people who hear it. So suddenly this, this um, technique for manipulating people went from, you know, it's not that important because you can't get that many people at one time involved to something very important. Everybody wants to do it. So we have over the last 50 years gotten more and more and more fearful just in general as a people as a people. The news runs nothing but bad news. It's only all the evil, terrible things that are going on in the world is all we ever see. Any news program that specialized just in showing happy people doing good things wouldn't last. Couldn't get a, a sponsor to pay any money for it. Nobody's interested in that. Everybody's interested in all the awful things that happen. It generates more fear. Oh, the terrorists are coming. More fear. Now we're on orange alert, then we're on red alert. Now we're down to, you know, fear, 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 fear. So <clears throat> politicians, advertisers, almost everybody else who would like to control us for one reason or another has been beating on these fear drums over mass media for 50 years. You know, I'm 72. I was uh, probably a seven or eight year old when TV first made its mark in, in my home. <coughs> And I think my parents were probably early adopters. So see, it's not been that long that we've had this mass media. And it took advertisers and other people a long while to realize that manipulating people through fear worked. So in the, in the early days, advertisements were fact-based. This is what my product does. This is why it's better than that product. You know, they were all facts. Not, you know, if you buy my beer, the girls will like you. See, that's irrational. That's, that's working to, toward an ego and toward a fear. So yes, we've become very fear-based in our culture. And that's just so obvious. When I was a kid, I was five years old, I'd get on my bicycle, my mom would say, be back by dinner time. I could be gone for five, six, seven hours on a bicycle. Five, six years old, no problem. Come back by dinner time. Now, if your child gets more than you know, 20 feet outside your house, there's a parent standing there right next to them, guarding them. You know? Nobody took the keys out of their car because they just wouldn't be able to find them later, so they just left them in the ignition. Stealing cars wasn't a problem. You know? <coughs> Nobody locked their home. So I grew up being a teenager, way to college, all that. You know, I come home. I could come home any time of day or night. The doors were open. They were always open. Nobody ever locked their doors. It'd just be a nuisance to have to get out a key and open it up again. That's the level of fear that was in the 50s and 60s. So yeah, we live in a very scary place now. Everybody's afraid of all kinds of things, and fear creates more fear. The more you're afraid, the easier it is to create more fear. So it's been a pile on with the mass media so that we can be manipulated. But it doesn't have to be evil, uh, you know, Illuminati hiding in the bushes that are trying to, you know, work the puppet strings. It's not all that complicated. It's just as complicated as advertisers can make, get your money if they can find your fear. Well, if you don't have a fear, they'll create one. They'll make you think that if you don't buy their beer, your life will be socially ruined. If they can create a fear, then they've got something to work with. So there's been a lot of fear creation technology engineered by psychologists and marketers and politicians and everybody else. It's just part of the times we live in, the mass communication. But it's that same mass communication that's gonna shrink our world down to the size of a village so we can all get along with each other, you see? <coughs> so it's not that the technology's evil. Technology's fine, it's just what we do with it is the problem, and we're just going to have to outgrow it. You know, Industrial Revolution was like that too. 
started out and you had these horror stories of you know eight-year-old children being chained to their machinery so they make sure they would come back you know it wouldn't run off and not come back well all right we've gotten over that we have labor laws child labor laws and other things that prevent that now but it started out as a pretty unruly thing well so did the internet start off as a pretty unruly thing there's lots of people scamming and lying and cheating and you know being obnoxious on the internet but we'll get over that we'll get through it and we'll, we'll get the good parts to work for us. It's working now, good parts. I mean, this, the reason that you got here and all these people got here is because there's an internet. If it wasn't for an internet, nobody would know that this was gonna take place. You see, the power of the internet's good too. So we as people have to be wise enough to ignore all that fear talk and to not be sucked into it. You know, I have people, uh, that I run into in my country where we just elected Donald Trump as president, you know, and it's like they're in a total panic mode. You know, what are we going to do now? It's going to be awful. <laughs> How are we going to live? You know, should we move out of the country? You know, what's going on? And they're very fearful. And I tell them, just relax. It's done. Deal with it. It's there. You know, work with it. See what you can do. Get by. What's your optimal solution to this? wringing your hands and going, oh no, oh no, you know, that's not the solution. You gotta get over that. So we, you know, we just have to ignore that stuff. But yeah, you're right, it's pretty bad. But it'll get better, hopefully. One last question, Tom. I last question, <coughs> is it that late? Oh, yeah. Tom, <coughs> thanks uh, for a wonderful uh, subject and bringing it here in the light of uh, scientific uh, understanding of it because uh, in India mostly people are driven spiritually. Okay, however, after uh, listening to you, I have two questions. First, you said that we can actually view future. Ah, uh, probable future. Yeah, probable future. Only a probable future. But somebody, I mean, looking from that perspective, if somebody saw the probable future, Mm -hmm. and it happened, for example, it happened, then are we not talking of a deterministic view of this universe model? Yeah. Okay, I'll just answer that one first, then you can do the next one. No, it's only a probable future. That probable future doesn't have to happen. That probable future is not a done deal. We have free will. We can change that future if we want. It's just probability. And they're, they're guesses based on what happened now. We'll guess what next things might be, all the possibilities that are next, based on that, the next. And we say, get out this probable future. But people in the present, all the actions in the present where people make free will choices, and that determines what actually happens. So some of those things that were very probable dissipate and never happen, goes away. Some of those things were very improbable end up happening. It's just a probable future. That's why you can change it only within the limits of the uncertainty of it. So no, it's not deterministic. Not deterministic at all. Free will is logically necessary for consciousness to exist, as is time. They have to be together. You can't have, what does conscious mean? What does making choices mean if there's no free will? Well, if there's no free will, there's really no choices either. You see, there's only pretend choices or illusion of choice. So if there is really choice, then there has to be free will. Well, what is consciousness? Consciousness is a choice making machine. It's a, it's all, you know, okay. Yeah. The next question is, when you're saying I-O, what is I-U, I-U-O-C, the yeah. individuated unit of consciousness, mm -hmm. and you're using word consciousness as well. Yeah. Two different things, I think. Yeah. Is consciousness is a property of I U O C or it's something Okay. There is and secondly one thing more I would like okay. to add here. My question would be if that is a property, consciousness we are referring term consciousness. We are traveling consciousness, moving from this life to another life, consciousness evolving and all that. Then how do we define three states in which we go through on a daily basis, like waking, dreaming, and sleep. Mm -hmm. How does the consciousness, is 
going through these phases? Is hmm. the consciousness experiencing dreaming state? Is the consciousness itself is in the <coughs> peace state where mm -hmm. it doesn't experience anything? So that means when we are waking up, is it not our own capacity which gets ignited and we create data stream? Why do we need to depend on the probabilities? Okay. There's Thank a bunch you. of there's several questions in there. <coughs> the the avatar has to obey a rule set. And that rule set sets constraints on the consciousness. One of the things the avatar has to do is sleep because the rule set in its biology needs that downtime to do whatever it needs to do. So that's, a, that's what happens to the consciousness. Now the consciousness then, we have this, this um, individuated unit of consciousness. That's the, that's the collector of all the lives lived, all get collected and integrated into one evolving thing. <clears throat> then there's this free will awareness unit that I mentioned, which was just a being level part of that individual unit of consciousness, and that's really what's logged onto the game. Okay? So when that avatar is asleep, then that free will awareness unit is not processing, because it's limited just to what the avatar is doing. So, for instance, if that avatar gets hit on the head with a pipe and causes brain damage, well, it's just a virtual brain. The brain's just ones and zeros on a computer, but that changes the constraints according to the rule set. So now the consciousness has to play an avatar that slurs its words and drags its left foot when it walks because of being that avatar was hit on the head with a pipe. You see, the rule set then creates new constraints for the free will awareness unit that's the player. Now, the individuated unit of consciousness that spawned that free will awareness unit, it's not shut down because an avatar is asleep because it's not directly connected to that avatar. It's its free will awareness unit. The subset of it is what's logged into the avatar. Okay. Does that make sense? A little bit. Okay. <clears throat> so the free will awareness unit takes a piece of itself out of its being level that I call the free, the, you know, the individual unit of consciousness takes a piece of itself at the being level, which I call the free will awareness unit, and that is what is logged in to the avatar. That's what's playing the avatar. Now, when that avatar's body has to sleep, that free will awareness unit goes blank, in the sense it's not processing anything. When that avatar uh, is in REM sleep, that free will awareness unit is experiencing. It's just another reality frame. That dream frame is no different than this frame. It's just a different virtual reality. And we have more than one virtual reality because experience is the key here. You have experience, you learn from it. Dream realities, you have different kinds of experience. So it's just a, another virtual reality to play in. So consciousness kind of works all day, works all night. All day it makes decisions for the, for the uh, avatar. At night it makes decisions for the avatar in the dream. And then when the avatar is unconscious, it can do other things, but it can't put them, it can't do those in the intellect. At the being level, it can do other things. You know, while you're sleeping and not dreaming, you may be connected other places, but it'll never end up in your consciousness. I mean, it'll never end up in your memory. Let's put it that way. So the thing that's confusing is that we have what I call big C consciousness. That's the larger consciousness system. That's all of consciousness. We free will awareness units are just a piece of that, a subset of it, have all basically the same properties as the whole. Uh, they're just smaller, you know, less capable subsets of it. And then we have this free will awareness unit is what the avatar calls consciousness. So when I say I'm conscious, I'm aware, I'm aware of all this stuff and you and what I'm saying, that's my free will awareness unit. See, that's little c consciousness. That's what I call my consciousness. Then I have the individuated unit of consciousness which assimilates all the lives I live and kind of integrates them into growing up and understanding. And then there's the larger consciousness system of which that's a part. So we're, we're looking at kind of pieces of pieces building this, this system. One more. We got one here.
this is uh, regarding you said uh, the difference between your uh, thing and hindu things like when she said advaita like both are same or it comes back to the same origin you said it need not come back to the same in yeah. hindu mythology there are there are three things are there dvaida advaita and third one is visishta advaita in that uh, they call it as paramatma and jivatma like you said capital c it's equivalent to paramatma mm -hmm. and jivatma is small c it's like individual consciousness mm -hmm. and it is like flower and its smell it never the same but not the different it's close by mm -hmm. so just i want to make a comment okay. this is yeah. the this is the way it is like depicted in the in well, yep, talk to the yeah. microphone so we have it Give her the microphone so we can get that recorded. It is the way it is depicted in Hindu spirituality. That is what he is trying uh, to yeah, okay. put the point forward. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah we, we really have very similar yes. systems. Yes, very, very similar. And why? There's only one truth. But there's millions of ways of approaching that truth. Millions of different metaphors you can use to approach it, right? But there's only one truth. So some people have chakras and other people don't, but they all end up working at the same truth. The metaphors are not that important. And there was one last question that was over here. Yes. Hi, Tom. Hi. Do you ever get angry? No. <clears throat> Do I ever get angry? Do you ever get angry? Uh, if you mean in the last 20 or 30 years, no. But did I ever get angry ever? Yes, of course, I got angry. Uh, I've, been, uh, I've been angry lots of times, but not for a long time. Okay. Not for a very um, long time. Recently I read in the news, an MP, member of parliament of uh, India, he uh, bought a business class, mm -hmm. but uh, he went into uh, all economy class uh, flight. And he he got so angry that he slapped the uh, some employee of the airline mm -hmm. 20, 20 over times. So is that number? <laughs> so when I read that, I kind of sympathized with the MP instead of the victim because, well, he bought the um, business class. He, he was expecting to uh, be in a business class, and yet he ended up in the uh, economy class. Mm -hmm. So. How would you, you know, deal with this sort of situation where you have a expectation of, of how things mm -hmm. going to be, but it's not your fault that things didn't turn out the way that you right. expected it to be, and mm -hmm. you get angry, you know. So, okay. How, how would how should an MP well, behave? The way you, the, the way you deal with that is that that expectation is your ego. That expectation. You know, is your belief. What you believe is do you, uh, what you think, you know, you ought to have. It's about you and, and, and uh, what you want, what you expect. There's an old phrase that says, blessed is he who has no expectations because he will be rarely disappointed. Get rid of the expectation. See life as an adventure. Things happen and we get to deal with it. Sometimes those things are real annoying. Well, that's a challenge. How are you going to deal with that? Okay, the person behind you, you're on a 12-hour flight, and the person behind you has a three-month-old baby, and it cries all the time. You're going to have to get off that flight and give a talk or do something, and you need to sleep. It's important. You're going to fail in your role as business or whatever you're doing because you're not going to get any sleep at night. Okay? That's an unpleasant situation to be in. Deal with it, you see? And by dealing with it in a positive way, it means you don't get upset. You accept it. Sometimes life is like that. Sometimes you get the bear, sometimes the bear gets you. Sometimes you get in a good situation and get advantages, and sometimes you get in a situation where you gotta put up with a lot of stuff you don't wanna put up with. And you just accept that, do your best, 
Well, the next day, you're just going to have to get up a little extra energy or whatever to do your job and do it well anyway, even if you are tired. And that's good. You'll learn something from that. It's a, it's a learning point. So the point is, no, there's no need to get angry. And once you stop trying to control what you want and just accept what you get and deal with it, then there's no reason to be angry. All of those things become interesting things like, oh, well, I guess this is mine to deal with and see how I'll do this. But as soon as you get angry and say, no, that's unfair, I shouldn't be disturbed like that, or you know, somebody shouldn't do those things to me, that's all about you. That's about you're not getting what you want. And if you don't get what you want, then you get angry because really it's all about you. And not getting what you want is a problem and there's somebody to blame for it. You see, all that's ego, ego, ego. And if you get rid of that ego, you never have that problem, it never comes up. You just don't get angry because it's, everybody's doing the best they can with what they've got to work with. And if you just keep that in mind and figure that sometimes people just get confused. It's not that they're horrible or whatever. Sometimes the baby cries and there's just nothing you can do about that. It's just the way it is. Maybe you could help. Offer to hold the baby for a while, you know. Maybe walk it up and down. Maybe there's something you could do. Particularly if that mom has three other children she's trying to deal with at the same time, you know. See if you can't help fix it rather than get angry with her. So that's how you deal with that. You don't have the expectation. You don't get upset. You see it as an opportunity to do something better, to be helpful or to be caring or just to persevere without anger or upset. And you'll learn something. You'll be better for it. Even if you had to give up and give your, get up in the, in the morning or before you go to bed, get off that flight, you may have to go work and you've been up all night listening to a baby cry. Well, do it. Give that presentation and make it good. Do the best you can and you accept what happens. If it didn't turn out all as well as it should, life's like that sometimes. That's what makes it interesting, you see? So that has to be the attitude that you have. The first problem is having an expectation. Expectations are a belief. You believe what's gonna happen and what should happen and then you feel like it's justified that it should happen and then you're angry that it doesn't. So you give up all of that and then there's no problem. The problem never comes up because you never get angry. Okay, we're done. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.